Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone, to the final day of the Biodesign Challenge Summit 2021. Before we begin, I just want to thank some of our sponsors one more time. Thank you again to Barilla. Thank you to Science Sandbox. Thank you to the National Endowment for the Arts. Thank you to Ginkgo Bioworks, Ecovative, Twist Bioscience, and SOS Ventures. Without your support, none of this would have happened this week. So we're very, very grateful. I also want to give a special shout out and a thank you to our judges. 66 judges came together to evaluate all of the student projects. Amazing job, everyone. I know it's hard every year to pick from all of these projects, but you guys come through every year. And again, this year you've done it again. So we appreciate it fully. Um, Additionally, I should thank Argus, of course. Argus HG is working behind the scenes with us. A big shout out to Jeff, Mark, and Tim who are working behind the scenes with us. I know you can't hear them, but they are literally making this show run. So thank you all. Thank you, thank you. Um, Vina, you want to go ahead? Yeah. Um, additionally, we want to thank our mentors, the artists, designers, scientists, and so many more who took time out of their schedules to visit the classrooms during the semester and help the students realize their projects. Uh, this year, many of these mentors accepted our invitation without hesitation. Uh, their willingness and graciousness to support the students and collaborate with strangers is what BDC is all about. Uh, last but not least, we want to, of course, give props to our students and instructors. You all make this competition as special as it is every year. Um, and it was inspiring to see you get through this tough semester to develop such fantastic projects that we've all been seeing this past week. Um, each one of you is a representative of your classroom, of your school, of your country, um, and you make us very, very proud. So a quick round of applause for you, team. Let's just the four of us. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Before we go on, um, I just, I've been doing it all week. I'm going to do it again. The Kickstarter campaign. We are 90% of the way there. Thanks so much to your support. This is a Kickstarter for our first ever book, Biodesign Challenger Retrospective. It's a compilation of voices from both our alumni and really the leading thinkers in biodesign. Please go check out the Kickstarter. Please enjoy our delightfully charming video and please uh, check out the rewards and buy a book. Um, we're extremely grateful to get this close to our goal in this short amount of period of time. And it is largely thanks to you all. So one, one more time, thank you so much for all of your support in this. I'm passing it over. Uh, yeah, I'd also like to take a moment to announce BDC's first alumni board. Uh, we're really excited for this. We've assembled this board as a way to foster and support our extensive BDC alumni community. Um, and so here is a video they put together to introduce themselves. Hi everyone, my name is Anne Hu and I'm currently an undergraduate student at Tufts University. I participated in the 2019 Biodesign Challenge with the Nest Makerspace team and our project was the GIY BioBuddy Biomaterial Toy Kit. I'm very excited to be part of the first Biodesign Challenge alumni board and I look forward to seeing all of your amazing projects at the summit. Hi, I'm Anique Saralegi. I participated in the Biodesign Challenge 2020 with the New York University Integrated Digital Media Program. I presented my project, Eats Biolab, um, and I recently graduated from NYU in a self-designed major called Regenerative Futures, which intersects environmental science, microbiology, and sustainable business. I'm so looking forward to seeing your guys' projects this year at the Biodesign Challenge of 2021. Hope to see you soon. Hi, everyone. My name is Fiona Bell. I am a PhD student at the University of Colorado Boulder, and I was a part of the MISO Domicilia BDC team in 2020. I am so honored to be a part of the first ever alumni board, and I'm excited for this year's virtual event. Hello, I'm Jiwon Woo, and I participated in the very first BDC 2016 with a project called Stabilimentum from the University of Pennsylvania. I've been working as a designer and lecturer, and I am truly excited to be a member of the first BDC alumni board. Hello everyone, my name is Luis Guzman, 
Uh, I'm really happy to be part of the alumni board. Uh, I was part of materials project from the University of Edinburgh in Biodesign Challenge 2018. And I'm really happy to see you all here. Hi, BDC. My name is Monica Butler Martinez, and I am a product designer and educator. I participated in the very first Biodesign Challenge back in 2016 with Team Stabilimentum, and I am now thrilled to be on the very first Biodesign Alumni Board. I am really looking forward to creating new ways to activate our vibrant community. Hi, I'm Sara Najad, and I participated in the Biodesign Challenge in 2020 with a project called Microbial Memories from IDM at New York University. Uh, I'm an artist and designer currently exploring the applications of biodesign in space exploration. And I'm so honored and excited to be part of the very first BDC alumni board. Enjoy the summit. Hi everyone, my name is Tihi Hussain and I am very excited and thrilled to be a part of this year's first alumni board of BDC 2021. I'm very excited to hear all about the projects this year at the summit and I wish you guys all the best. Good luck. Hi everyone, my name is Trisha Satish and I'm a high school senior in the California Bay Area. I participated in the 2019 Biodesign Challenge under the GRY BioBuddies Biomaterial Toy Kit Project along with the Nest Maker Space team. I'm so excited to be a part of the first Biodesign Challenge Alumni Board and I hope everyone is having a great time with the summit. Bye! All right, what an amazing video. Uh, I think that was a great introduction to the energy that, that the alumni board is, is coming in with for the first time this year. And I can't wait to see all they accomplish uh, over their first term. Uh, so we're gonna move in to starting to announce prizes. Uh, yesterday, the judges had to make some very difficult decisions. Over the next hour and a half, we'll be airing those uh, top six student videos, which we'll announce very, very soon. Uh, these will then be followed by our speakers, who are going to be Janina Jeff at 1230, followed by Kathy High and Lisa Marginelli at one o'clock. Uh, our speakers will be followed by our award ceremony. Uh, we will announce the winner of the glass microbe. Uh, at the very end of the day, I hope I hope you stick around to hear the winner this year. Uh, but first, uh, I'm going to turn over to Dan, who is going to announce our sponsored prizes this year and the winners of those prizes. Thanks, Alex. All right. We've been working on this for a long, long time. So it is my absolute pleasure to announce the winner of the Science Sandbox Prize. Science Sandbox Prize for Public Engagement. Uh, the winner is Biotech Palatero card from Nest Makerspace. Congratulations, students. Also, the winner for the Barilla Prize for Regenerative Living Ecosystems is Permapac from the School of Art Institute of Chicago. Congratulations, teams. We're going to show their videos, and then uh, the teams from Science Sandbox and Barilla will come to congratulate the students during our award ceremony. So let's air the videos. Go ahead, Jeff. Who is missing from the table in biodesign and sustainable agricultural discussions? Agricultural communities and the youth of these communities. Biotech Baletero Cart, accessible biodesign education, multi-generational learning on the streets and in the parks. Hello, we are a team of high school students from the Salinas area in Monterey County of California. We have been meeting remotely with the Nest Maker Space on Saturdays since January. We all attend Alsa High School in Salinas. The problem, ag worker communities need access to entry points to learn about the biodesign and contribute to ideas for sustainable ag tech. We aim to create a fun and accessible opportunities for our community to learn about biodesign so they can envision a sustainable agriculture future for themselves and the world. The skilled technologist who has also a deep crow knowledge is a unicorn because there are so few. In our community of Alisa Salinas, we need biodesign education. We have none in our school. It is really important we have this education because we are directly impacted by biotech and ag, ag tech. Our community is surrounded by agricultural fields and pesticide usage. Who are we in Salinas? We are the salad bowl of the world. We feed our nation. Total ag economic impact is $8 billion per year. Crops grown in Monterey County supply the large percentages of total national pounds produced per year. 
61% of leaf lettuce, 57% of celery, 56% of head lettuce, 48% of broccoli, 38% of spinach, 30% of cauliflower, and 28% of strawberries. In our community of Alas Salinas, the median income is 54000 One in five households relies on income related to agriculture. Median age is 30 years, 31% under 18 years old. Our solution was informed by two surveys. The first was the Bio Plus Food Plus Tech form conducted by the Salinas Community Biolab Jinapa and Tech Interactive. It surveyed teens on how they wanted to be taught about biodesign. The results show that local teens wanted to focus on food systems, field workers, hands-on activities, connections to art, computer science, social justice, and gardening. Here's the data from the AgroStyle team's Instagram survey of 76 participants. AgroStyle is the other Salinas BDC team. It reinforces our intent to create multi-generational accessible programming. The results show that the community believes agricultural workers and the elderly need to be included in sustainability agricultural conversations. Based on this information and our own brainstorming, we decided to make a biotech palatero cart to share biodesign activities with the people on the street and in the parks. In our community, a palatero cart represents sweet childhood moments, playful connection on neighborhood streets, and it's a space of trust. It is a good way to bring new conversations to communities. We believe our agricultural community of Alas Salinas needs a fleet of paletero cards sharing biodesign education so our community can open its eyes to biotechnology and be empowered to be the first generation of its use in our Salinas Valley. We created a biotech paletero card and conducted a pilot program in Atividad Creek Park. We enjoyed participating and collaborating with city and community organizations. This was the very first public community event in, in the park this year. We participated in the space with local urban gardeners, downtown streets team, Salinas Valley Recycling, and City of Salinas and Monterey County. Algae string. We had a biomaking activity where people could explore making algae string from sodium alginate and calcium chloride. We asked people to share ideas for future uses. One visitor suggested algae string as a replacement for plastic produce bags. We learned that algae string is conductive when wet and not conductive when dry. We conduct this experiment at the event for people to see. How might this be useful as a circuit on-off switch in agricultural sensor device? One visitor suggested bio-based sensor, bio sensors for automated plant watering. When resistance gets too high, watering starts. DIY hygrometer and watering system. We displayed a micro-based self-watering system. This used turbo motor and straw with a DIY nail hygrometer. We use MakeCode to program our micro bits. Another activity we had was a paper microscope. We put a plexiglass sphere and taped it into paper to create a paper microscope. And we observed vibrant flower petals and other plant materials. This is an inexpensive way of showing people science. We share a mycelium container so people could imagine growing a pot or a vase or food packaging in new ways. Two members of our team, Alec and Roberto, created 3D print root biome study tools in Tinker, in tinker Card. These were 3D printed. We created these to raise awareness of the unseen root environment in the soil. These tools can be used to create a controlled environment to grow seeds. What are good local fertilizers we can make using waste from fishing from the fishing industry and algae? Our fleet of Baltech Balatero cards will spark, sustain, and deepen interest and ownership of the questions driving ag tech and biotech in our community. Our model of street vending cards is a way to engage other communities also missing from sustainability biodesign conversations. Accessible biodesign education and explorations will greatly impact the future equity and social justice in agricultural worker communities. Let's grow biodesign learning in friendly, trusted spaces and bring more people into the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. According to city records, less than 9% of plastics thrown out in Chicago are recycled. The uncomfortable reality is that most of our plastic waste does not have a sustainable life cycle and ends up a permanent blight in landfills and as microplastics. 
Our unrecyclables are closer to us than an exported problem. This map shows the density of active landfills in the U.S. and Puerto Rico. This is a landfill located in Zion, Illinois, slated to close in 2027. You can notice the trucks for scale. These are massive mountainous heaps of buried trash with dangerous health repercussions, including leachate and off-gassing. Incineration of these plastics has the immediacy of climate change acceleration by emissions. What if our single-use materials were not eternal? Designed with a regenerative life cycle, Permapack Biopolymer is a marine and waste stream solution that does not extract land resources. Our project foregrounds compostability and the circularity of permaculture ecology. We look to proteins and polysaccharides made in the cells of plants, mycelium, seaweed, and insects for a biologically degradable solution with scalable ecology. When searching for a market application for kelp farming, a critical tool in carbon fixing against the climate crisis, there couldn't be a more pertinent market. How many bags do you pass on a daily walk? Plastic films and poly bags are responsible for the lion's share of environmental pollution. 46% of ocean plastics, non-recyclable leakage that never makes it to the landfill, Permapack's hybrid biopolymer is a vision of degradation as enrichment and market popularization for a seaweed-based climate solution. Bioplastics on the current market claim shorter life cycles but must be industrially degraded, an energy-intensive process under high pressure. Unlike seaweed cultivation, starch-based feedstocks compete for land and freshwater resources for food production or require further clearing of land. It encourages monoculture and inequitable land disenfranchisement at odds with sustainable permaculture. Starch-based bioplastics shortfall us in their brittleness, requiring majority constituent additives which counteract degradability. The outcome is energy-intensive industrial degradation, we lack the sorting infrastructure to execute, or microplastic pollution. Conventional agar bioplastics and biotextiles suffer too from the problems of shrinkage, lack of stress integrity, and moisture regulation, which sometimes grows mold. Our hybrid polymer purposefully incorporates mycelial chitosan and antimicrobial silk cocoon protein to eliminate these contingencies. Dissatisfied with the questionable degradability of bioplastics and with paper products relying on deforestation and water-intensive energy-emissive processing, we designed a minimally processed permaculturally degradable material. A regenerative chitosan source, unconstrained by region, season, or agribusiness practices of global aquaculture, is discarded mycelial biomass from citric acid production. The fermentation of Aspergillus niger for citric acid yields 80,000 tons a year of discarded mycelial biomass, which is a more sustainable source than crustacean shells. Worldwide production of agaricus mushroom leads 50,000 metric tons per year of mycelial waste, and pleuritis is becoming an ever-important packing and building material. Given that our formula only uses about 8 grams of chitosan per square meter of biopolymer, the immense amount of chitosan in the growing mycelial waste stream encourages us to imagine circularity at scale. Saracen is a crucial element to create the flexibility and tensile strength of our novel biopolymer application. Saracen is a serine-rich protein found in the cocoons of silkworms that is extracted during silk degumming and treated as wastewater. For short-run scalability, we propose a regenerative system of mulberry tree propagation for sericulture that utilizes the shed chitin of silkworm growth cycles, with feed and bedding waste composted by vermiculture into fertilizer for more mulberry trees. In this cruelty-free system, the silkworms would be reared for the completion of their life cycle and not culled for fiber. For long-run scaling, we propose the microbial synthesis of sequenced saracen. 
We have discussed the logistical leap with a synthetic biologist at Rowan University, and our professor, Dr. Andrew Scarpelli, has proposed connecting with colleagues at Northwestern Center for Synthetic Biology for this collaborative effort. We are also consulting with UIC civil and materials engineer Matthew Daly on performance testing. We have extracted the advantageous properties of the silk protein like its polymeric strength, resistance to oxidative degradation, antibacterial qualities, and moisture retention. In ongoing control tests, our heat-sealed biopolymer packaging performs comparably to its petrochemical competitors, polyethylene products such as saran wrap, cereal bags, and other single-use consumer plastics. A 10-day control study test with tofu showed no visible signs of moisture loss or mold growth. We continue to test with other produce. Its most impressive performance has been its tensile strength and high tear resistance. It laser cuts superbly for pattern making and can be sewn. Best of all, it decomposes in a worm bin or garden compost. With Permapack, we see within reach a synthesis of marine forestation waste stream utility, accessible home compost degradation, and local food sovereignty for our near future. What's next? We are working to demonstrate soil and marine biological degradation under conditions in natural environments. This means respirometry tests, germination analysis, and microscopy for microparticles after breakdown. The vast majority of consumers do not have access to home or industrial compost facilities, so we prioritize biodegradability in real-world conditions. Material innovation is the solution focus because of the high-volume, low-value niche in replacing thin film plastics. We are expanding the rigor and range of our applications testing. In addition to this, we're expanding the range of our digitally fabricated molds for casting, injection molding, and vacuum forming, including a self-sealing closure. For ongoing social engagement, we've been sending samples to artists and designers, producing a video survey of how they imagine the future ecology with materials to be. And we're also building an open source repository site of biomaterials research and best practices. Unwrap the future with us. All right, congratulations to both of our sponsored prize winners. Um, now, without further ado, we are going to announce our top six teams. Emma, would you like to share? I would love to. All right, here they are. So, congratulations. Uh, congratulations, Universidad de los Andes Lixilab. Ball State University River Defenders. College for Creative Studies Reform. Spelman College Subversive Bio, bio Fashion for Black Lives. Alto University Dip Rap. And finally, School of the Art Institute of Chicago Permapack. Congratulations, everyone. So we're going to go straight into our first video from Universidad de los Andes Lixi Lab. Can you recall a family dinner where the topic de rigueur was climate change related to pollution, global warming, or water contamination? What if there was another wicked problem, often not known and overlooked? In 2015, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations reported soil contamination is one of the main threats affecting the world's land services. The source of this type of pollution can be linked to chemical products used in agriculture, manufacturing, and even in military operations. These substances containing one of the primary sources of soil contamination, heavy metals such as chromium, lead, nickel, copper, cadmium, and arsenic, end up being released into the environment. But that's not all. Did you know that your garbage can contribute to this problem? After garbage is disposed, it usually reaches local landfills, producing leachate, liquids coming from waste decomposition containing heavy metal that seep into the soil and water. Despite the pandemic's limitations, we were determined to find a bio-solution by co-working with a farming community. That is why we arrived at Mochuelo Alto, a rural community in the outskirts of Bogotá, Colombia's capital, located next to the city's landfill. Today, a population of 5,000 people depends on agriculture as their livelihood. 
They are directly affected by leachate metals, causing contamination in water sources and altering the soil's biodiversity. These metals also reduce organic matter, drive harmful effects in plants, inhibit growth and nutrition assimilation in crops. The economic costs for the community are directly related to this weak problem by having low productivity and crop quality reduction. But did you know that even the most committed consumer faces risk due to the produce exposure and intake of contaminated vegetables and animal sourced food? The impact on the consumer could be associated to health issues, as heavy metals are related to cancer and adverse effects on their nervous, respiratory, reproductive and cardiovascular systems. Lixi Lab was born to empower small farmers who produce 70% of food in Colombia and who represent 90% of the world's agricultural community. We recognize the importance to bring the farm-to-table movement to this community and foster organic, seasonal and local produce, supporting Colombia's farming communities. Lixi Lab is a grassroots, feasible by innovative solution joining science, design, and systems thinking with empathetic design methodologies. Lixilab is a bioremediation technology using the bacteria Lysinibacillus spiricus CBM5 for extracting heavy metals in farmed soils. But how does this all happen? We co-designed with a Lixilab influencer. Lysinibacillus spiricus CBM5 is a bacillus-type non-pathogen bacterium it is isolated from uranium mining waste piles and petroleum exploration sites and is studied for bioremediation purposes since its superpower lies in the fact that it is metal resistant. This sucker can accumulate heavy metals like lead, chromium, cadmium, arsenic and even degrade hydrocarbons. What? Really? No way! An authentic bio-influencer! But wait, that's not all! The bacterium work even if it's dead. Yes, you heard right, as dead bacteria. According to research, Lysinibacillus spiricus CBM5 absorbs metal after it has completed its life cycle, just like it did when it was alive and kicking, because of its self-assembling protein, known as the S-layer, that can self-assemble in two-dimensional structures strapping metals in its microscopic holes. Additionally, it works with functional groups, which gives bacteria its affinity to metal ions facilitating metal adsorption. This layer is found negatively charged on the cell membrane, therefore bacteria can adsorb positively charged metals. Also, it has amazing advantages because of its lack of metabolic susceptibility by environment fluctuation given by undesired horizontal gene transfer from other microorganisms. The farmer community at Mochuelo was skeptical about introducing living bacteria into the soil because of all the bad rap it has, especially right now. Our technology applies the bacteria in a dehydrated hydrogel matrix made of a chitosan and alginate blend that works in water and soil. We chose those biopolymers because these are non-toxic, biocompatible, biodegradable and are obtained in large quantities all over the world at a low cost. Lixi Soil, our first biotech application, contains a biofilter which prevents and diminishes the number of heavy metals in agricultural soils. It's designed to control contaminants on surface-rooted plants like vegetables and tubers, measuring up to 60 cm or 2 feet. After introducing it to the soil, a porous version of the hydrogel is inserted, and then water is added so that the bacteria can have better contact with the earth. This hands-on practical system works along with the farmers' knowledgeable practices and tools. The root-inspired capsule design is buried in the soil. Its packaging contains chitosan and alginate spheres soaked with dead bacteria. The container is inserted into the ground according to the farmer's need. A fence with several filters can be placed individually at a variety of locations on the land. The design is easy to use. Just unwrap the package and insert the hydrogel spheres and water into the capsule. Leave Lixi soil until the conductivity sensor indicates and refill with a new package or remove the capsule for seating. 
After changing the matrix, farmers will return the packaging with the bacteria filled metals for collection at indicated locations in public and communal spaces. Lixi Aqua is our second biotech application, designed for implementation in water sources, used for irrigation, storage tanks, ponds, and other daily uses. It contains the hydrogel filter coated with dead bacteria. Lixi Aqua should be placed in the medium up to one day to do its filtering process. At the end of the sphere's life cycle, metals are extracted from the bacteria in a lab. The service is included with the product in which trained professionals methodically remove the metals. The system is low cost and uses a certified polymer biocomposite that is easily recyclable and has neutral carbon footprint. Lixilab's mission is to make toxic free crops possible, increasing good health and well being of farming communities and consumers, preventing heavy metals leaching from landfills, reducing the risk of people suffering diseases. Lixilab's sustainable development goals share commitments towards zero hunger by preventing waste and crop losses, and obtaining more fertile productive lands also guarantees the ecosystem's biodiversity and reduces land degradation. When comparing Lixilab to other soil remediation technologies as soil washing, thermal and electrical treatment, it has shown that its biotechnology reduces human and environmental risks. It is low cost and it does not require continuous maintenance nor does it require fossil fuel energy or other finite resource other than the water or humidity found in the environment. Lixilab can also be useful in areas where mining has been conducted or militarized zones that have released heavy metals in the soil. Our professional team will keep working diligently to continue creating new biotech applications. Our next step is to reinforce the material matrix, creating a durable, tough product that meets quality standards and benefits underrepresented communities that otherwise would not have access to a biomediation procedure. Lixilab, strengthening farming communities from the soil up. Wonderful job, Lixilab. That was a great presentation. Congratulations. We are now going to move on to our next finalist team from Ball State University, River Defenders. Invasive species are at our doors, barging in unannounced, causing nearly irreversible damage. Now it's our job to get rid of them, and we start with these. Carp, the bottom feeders. There are three main species. Big head carp, silver carp, and black carp. They eat 120% of their weight in zooplankton and phytoplankton, a crucial food source of our walleye, bluegill, and smallmouth bass. Therefore, we need to eradicate these species of carp from our waters. Complete annihilation is necessary. These carp fight hard battles. We've already tried multiple ways of eradicating them. Now we are developing a new approach. Using the latest advancements in technology, we have designed a bioweapon to fight against the carp. After years of iteration, we are finally ready to release it to the public. There is a looming threat to America and the Midwest. 139 invasive species currently inhabit the waterways of Indiana alone, causing a variety of negative ecological impacts. River Defenders arms fish that are native to the White River, such as walleye. With our help, they may have a fighting chance. Combining human advancements in weapons technology and the natural capabilities of aquatic life, this idea proposes that a military-grade tactical vest be attached to native fish. The vest is equipped with two items, a waterproof camera that provides a live feed to the River Defender's operator, and a remote-controlled firearm. This firearm follows in the steps of the Heckler & Koch P-11, both in its construction and history. The P-11 was one of the many products of weapons development during the Cold War, and served as a direct competitor to the Soviet Union's SPP-1, which had been produced five years prior in 1971. At the time, frogmen could only engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat with knives, the development of weapons like these expanded the possibilities of underwater combat. The P-11 was designed with the knowledge that traditional bullets don't travel well through water. It features five barrels that hold flechettes, or metal darts that allow for better accuracy and range. 
When fired, the P-11 is electrically ignited from a battery pack within the gun. River Defenders builds upon this design with increased ammunition capacity and remote operation via Bluetooth technology. With an official state-of-the-art app, any Muncie resident can connect their smartphone to a River Defender within a range of 800 feet. Once connected, the user can obtain a fisheye's view of the White River from the camera attached to each fish. Using the invasive species identification software, the user can fire the weapon when a carp appears, taking an active role in combating ecological imbalance. As bizarre as this idea may seem, the U.S. military is no stranger to creating alliances with wildlife. For example, in World War II, engineers considered using bat bombs as a weapon against Japan. Once napalm was attached to Mexican free-tailed bats, they would be released to roost in buildings and hard-to-reach places. Another example is Project Pigeon, which utilized the cognitive abilities of pigeons to guide missiles. The pigeons were trained to recognize certain targets and then placed in front of a screen with sensors. The birds would peck at the screen when the target moved away from the center of it, maintaining the bomb's glide path. River Defenders is a testament to the new bonds we may forge with our natural environment in order to protect our traditions and values. In today's society, there is a disconnect between parents and their children due to the fact that most parents were raised without technology. Their children, however, are raised in the digital age and spend increasing amounts of time indoors on phones or tablets. River Defenders bridges this gap between parents and children, creating a new family bonding activity that both generations can enjoy. Over the past two decades, the cleanliness of the White River has also become a major cause for concern. As the river gradually becomes more saturated with heavy metals, PCBs, and other pollutants, recreational activities are becoming unsafe. In fact, river defenders may replace the traditional American pastime of fishing trips. Gone are the days of old school fishing. Now, with river defenders, a new exciting pastime exists. The future is now. The river defenders must work together in order to form a more perfect union to ensure the peace of the White River. It is your time to take action. The River Defenders has a practical function to engage and mobilize the Muncie populace in protecting the ecology of the White River. It is also a band-aid solution that turns human conquest of the natural world into a violent interactive spectacle. As an example of both biodesign and critical design, River Defenders tackles both environmental and social issues at once. Rooted in the Italian radical design movement of the 60s and 70s, critical design challenges an audience's preconceptions. It's meant to provoke new ways of thinking. Anthony Dunn and Fiona Ravi define critical design goals as raising awareness, exposing assumptions, provoking action, sparking debate, and even entertaining. Oftentimes, these projects explore speculative futures ranging from dystopian to utopian. River Defenders aims to do just that, using the topic of invasive species as a point of departure. Stuart Hall, the cultural theorist, once said, there is no understanding Englishness without understanding its imperial and colonial dimensions. The United States has used this idea for centuries to villainize the other. Under the guise of protection, the U.S. then resorts back to its usual methods of complete eradication and declarations of war. Time after time again, these methods prove wasteful and unsuccessful. Using these ideas in the previous video conveys how the saturation of xenophobia further warps any chance we have of enacting reasoned and positive change. If we continue to view every problem through these lenses of fear and hate, our needed solutions will be unreachable. River Defenders was created to highlight issues with the war on invasives. In the field of ecology, some experts are beginning to take issue with rhetoric surrounding invasive species. The militaristic idea of complete eradication ignores positive qualities that non-native species might bring to an ecosystem. One study showed that, quote, invasive species research uses significantly more militaristic language, end quote, than other subfields of conservation. The power of messaging like this shouldn't be understated. In the short term, rallying communities to declare war on certain species could be helpful. However, it may do more harm than good in the long term distorting the public's understanding of ecology and reinforcing xenophobic tendencies. This conversation gets more complex as we realize that many of our beloved commonplace species were once considered alien or non-native. While not deemed invasive, 
the honeybee was imported to North America from Europe in the 17th century. We now depend on this poster child of conservation for billions of dollars worth of crops. However, it could be deemed invasive as soon as it begins outcompeting species of wild native bees. Examples like these show the blurry line between helpful and harmful. We then must add climate change into the equation. Climate change is rapidly redefining relationships between all organisms. Consider the tamarisk shrub, for example. Though it has outcompeted many native trees and uses large amounts of water, it has begun to provide habitats for endangered species like the southwestern willow flycatcher. It is also hardy and drought tolerant, addressing a problem that we will face in the near future. Invasives like these can withstand shifting temperatures and low resources, and may be the only way our ecosystems can survive. Some scientists even predict they could help us preserve our working ecology. The damage caused by invasive species like cane toads and big head carp is irrefutable, and River Defenders doesn't aim to understate it. However, if we refuse to explore new roles they might play in this ever-changing environment, we will keep falling back into costly, unsuccessful methods time after time again. Let's work to build new solutions that look toward the future. Awesome job, River Defenders. Such a unique and fascinating project. Congrats. Um, we are now going to be moving on to our next top team from College for Creative Studies, Reform. Welcome to Reform, Reformation of Thermoforming Materials. Since 1964, vacuum forming has become one of the most common methods of processing plastic materials. The process involves heating a plastic sheet until soft and then draping it over a mold. A vacuum is applied forming the sheet onto the mold. Once cooled, the thermoformed sheet can be removed. Vacuum formed products are all around us and play a major part in our daily lives, from yogurt cups to hot tubs. Many consumer packaged goods, or CPG, utilize vacuum formed materials for a very limited existence. Although they serve a temporary function, the materials used in the process, such as ABS, polystyrene, PVC, polycarbonate, and polypropylene have lasting effects on the environment. Because of this, 30 states in the U.S. currently have some form of legislation regarding banning commonly thermoformed plastics. These legislations have led companies to seek new and alternative material development in accordance to our global shift away from plastics. We spoke to Julie Reed, industrial designer at packaging solutions company, DART, about how they are reacting to these shifts. It is something that we are actively working on. We have entire departments allocated towards doing research and development. So we have to question, if thermoformed materials and CPGs require a limited existence, why use materials with such permanence? To solve this problem with a circular mindset, we aligned ourselves with the UN 2030 Sustainable Development Goal number 12 which is to ensure sustainable consumption and production patterns. We created a list of criteria for our material. This introduced us to a field of industrial food byproducts, the materials left behind with no sustainable use case in their life cycle. Our search for byproducts led us down several avenues, from orange peels to eggshells and many more. We selected local byproducts, spent grains, and sugar beet molasses based on the properties we discovered and the added sustainability factor of locality. In the United States, beer is the fourth most consumed beverage with 5.5 billion gallons produced each year. This consumption leaves approximately 223 million pounds of spent grain left over after the brewing process. Although spent grains have been stripped of sugars after the brewing process, they still contain polysaccharides. Polysaccharides are organic polymers composed of many disaccharides. Disaccharides are molecules composed of two simple sugars. Simple sugars are also known as monosaccharides. Spent grains are also largely composed of fiber and protein that can introduce additional structure to our biomaterial. The U.S. alone is expected to produce 35 million tons of sugar beets in 2021, 
while only yielding 5.2 million tons of sugar, leaving a tremendous amount of waste, including molasses as a byproduct. Sugar beet molasses contain the building blocks of polysaccharides, glucose and fructose, as well as disaccharides, sucrose. We hypothesized that we could create a strong yet elastic material by combining the properties of molasses and spent grains that can be applied to thermoforming processes. Then the fun began. We sourced our molasses from a sugar beet farm, Michigan Sugar Company, and our spent grains from Net Zero, an upcycling platform that captures and converts industrial food and beverage byproducts. We also included glycerol as a plasticizer and gelatin to provide flexibility. Our material development started by finely grinding our spent grains, then sifting it through a 190 micron filter to achieve a homogeneous texture and color by removing impurities. We formulated recipes with different ratios of ingredients to achieve the mechanical properties needed for the material. We started in the wood shop to fabricate frame molds for our materials to set up in and be vacuum form ready. In the lab, we measured out ratios of ingredients and cooked many samples in order to find a successful recipe. After pouring and leaving to cure for 72 hours, the samples were ready to take the ultimate test in the ProtoVac 100. The samples were heated and deemed ready when the top material began to sag and bubble. We pressed them over the forms, and some didn't make it back. But with our failures, we found successes. Introducing Reform, a thermoformable biopolymer that offers an alternative to petroleum-based polymers with applications for rapid prototyping and consumer packaged goods. Our material has a unique natural appearance and finish from the spent grains and molasses combined. It is uniquely elastic making it suitable for thermoforming processes and keeps its shape after the release of a mold. Compared to polystyrene, Reform is biodegradable, compostable, and free of the negative impacts its petroleum-based counterparts have. Reform is meant for biodegrading rather than recycling. Molasses and spent grains are both used in the agriculture industry for bioremediation of soil and water. And because they are byproducts, no new land use is needed. Our material can provide benefits to our environment rather than harm it. We sought out an expert in the field of design and spoke to industrial designer Patrick Schiavone about Reform's potential. He believed that it could be used for any kind of product that has to come in a box that will in a completely biodegradable package. And again, I'm in love with the way it looks. It looks so natural. In order to reach this potential, we are looking to have our material tested and discover its limits. Off of our conversation with Pat, we prototyped what packaging could look like and experimented with pattern formations. We shared our prototypes with Julie Reed from Dart to get her initial insights. This is super, super exciting. And, and frankly, it's amazing the quality of forming that you've been able to get with this. I'm shocked with it. Um, what I think that your material has going for it is I I see it and I see natural, but I see that it's also behaving the way I expect it to when it comes to thermoforming. We believe Reform has the potential to reframe what thermoform materials can be now and in the future. Great job, Reform from College for Creative Studies. Congratulations. Uh, we are now going to move on to our next finalist video from Spelman College, Subversive uh, Biofashion for Black Lives. The action of Rosa Parks, the words and leadership of Martin Luther King Jr. inspired me to find a way to get in the way. And I got in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble. In 2012, a 17-year-old Trayvon Martin was visiting his father in Sanford, Florida. 
During a short walk from the local store, Martin was stalked and gunned down by an ex-neighborhood watch captain, who was eventually tried and acquitted. This trial and results created a ripple of sadness and disappointment through the black community. The black community responded with the hashtag, I am Trayvon Martin, a social media protest campaign that featured celebrities and allies wearing hoodies, the outfit that was believed to have caused the profiling of this black boy walking through his neighborhood. Shortly after the acquittal of Martin's murderer, the phrase hashtag Black Lives Matter emerged on Twitter. This movement gained momentum as a social justice juggernaut that sought to center the disparity of threat to black lives in our society. The hoodie became a symbol of every person of color who had experienced racial profiling while simply existing. Subversive, biofashion for black lives. We began our project as part of an Afrofuturist speculative design process that concluded with inspiration from the Biodesign Challenge. Say goodbye to the wind by J.G. Ballard. We were challenged to find or create representations of ourselves in this dystopian future. After further exploration of many variations of biodesigns to support black lives, we landed on our current project presentation. Our group was divided into three teams materials, sensors and schema, and design, each supported by a Spellman faculty member within the discipline. This project features a speculative and critical wearable design that will integrate wearable sensors that can collect biometric data from the wearer. The individual data collected can be crowdsourced across urban landscapes and used by entities designed to provide therapeutic and protective response mechanisms. This biodesigned garment is meant to be a subversion of the hoodie, typically worn throughout the black community. Through our speculative upcycling of the typical hoodie, we envision an Afrofuturist wearable design to change the narrative of the social impact of wearing a hoodie while being black. We began our process using a variety of materials and processes in our iteration to find best examples of the ideas we wanted to express in this garment. Limitations of our isolated existence has made it difficult to explore many physical prototypes. Thinking about the material for our hoodie, we first explored the characteristics that we wanted our hoodie to possess. The first was physical protection. This desire led us to explore materials that resist force and pressure. Accordingly, the outer material is modular and comprised of a matter made of spider silk, silk leather from Tuft University's Silk Lab. This layer is rip, puncture, and water resistant. However, the fabric for our hoodie is triple layered. The second layer encased in the outer layer is made of a compressed mixture of starch and water oobleck, to create a polymer with non-Newtonian properties to encase the flexible electric components and provide the wearer with protection from blunt force trauma without sacrificing mobility. Finally, the inner layer is made of a removable conductive mesh that would connect the different modules together as a network. This part of the garment could be removed and can easily be washed. The various sensors within our hoodie measures a range of biometric data, including body temperature, heart rate, blood pressure, breathing rate, and it also provides an EEG of the wearer's brain when the hood of the garment is pulled up and over the wearer's head. This is all in an attempt to determine the wearer's state of well-being. The data obtained by the hoodie sensors with regard to body temperature, heart rate, breathing rate, and blood pressure will then be used to reflect the wearer's state of well-being in the arm and hand band of the hoodie such that a calm state is represented by blue, a nervous or slightly irritated state is represented by green, a fearful state is represented by orange, and panic attacks or cases of extreme fear are represented by red. The color changing aspect of the hoodie is premised on an if then else loop, such that if certain biometric data, as measured by the sensors, falls within a specific range as stated in the code for the loop, the color of the hoodie's hand and arm bands change using LED motors as stated within the code reflecting the output for that range. We envision our design existing as an embodiment of historically rooted community connectivity. In the same way that the grapevine has been used to share community networks around sentiment, threat, and well-being, this hoodie would allow for members of the community to share and propagate data that would allow for support networks to engage as needed. 
Additionally, wearers would be, could be community members who are involved in various forms of engagement or activism, whether primary actors who are witnessing events of note or those who are secondarily engaged. The data can be encrypted and securely shared and sourced across landscape and utilized by local community organizers, leaders, and support structures who are providing care and support. According to the UN, conflict and security, weak institutions, and limited access to justice remain a great threat to sustainable development. By respecting human rights in this time of crisis, we will build more effective and inclusive solutions for the emergency of today and the recovery for tomorrow. We believe that our subversive biodesign will afford Black communities the opportunity to create a more positive well-being among its members, specifically those facing threats of brutality and marginalization. We, the Spellman Biodesign team, would like to thank you for acceptance of our biowearable designed submission that seeks to support peace, justice, and inclusive societies as part of our commitment to Representative John Lewis's charge to find and embody necessary trouble. We found this work to be incredibly thought-provoking, as it challenged us to see ourselves in a society that promotes the well-being of black lives. We'd like to thank our advisors and teachers for their support, and we thank you for your time. Wonderful job, Subversive team. Congratulations. Um, we are now going to be moving on to our next finalist team from Alto University, Dip Rap. Take a moment to look around you. Can you spot one item made of plastic? We are drowning in a material culture of plastic dependency in which every year 380 million tons of plastics are produced and 8 million tons are released into the oceans. Although plastics take more than 400 years to decompose, 83% of all plastic packaging goes into landfills, of which households are responsible for 80% of the waste. It leads to microplastics in food chains, threatening wildlife, being ingested by species, killing marine Poor life, filling up landfills, polluting the land, blocking drains, and causing flooding. It's simply too overwhelming for us four to start tackling on our own. So we've decided to start small, by beginning our journey with a cucumber. We thought, instead of starting with a sheet of plastic, what if we could package the cucumbers with a dippable, bio-based solution that dries into a thin, protective film? Currently in Finland and in many other countries, cucumbers are shrink-wrapped in plastic before being transported and sold. This method involves temporarily heating a plastic film to around 180 degrees Celsius before covering the surface of the cucumbers with it. Not only does this method contribute to huge amounts of plastic waste, but it also requires extensive machinery and production of heat. But the thing is, packaging is not just negative. Studies have shown that shrink-wrapped cucumbers last three times more than an unwrapped one and will only lose 1.5% of their weight after two weeks compared to an unwrapped one with 3.5%. And so our quest for a bio-based dippable packaging solution began. Developing our quick drying liquid packaging solution was not an easy task, and it was challenging to find similar projects and prior research to guide us. In the lab, we decided to take our first step with agar, which is a commercially available non-toxic substance. It can, for example, be used as a gelling agent in the food industry or solidifying agents in bacterial cultures. When the cucumbers were dipped in the agar solution, we achieved satisfactory results as we managed to obtain a glossy, transparent protective film. What's more, the film could be easily peeled off and then disposed of in the bio-waste. However, how can we make sure that the packaging is able to withstand the varying humidity of the atmosphere? Therefore, we added a small volume of dispersed carnauba wax solution in the agar solution to create a more hydrophobic film. And we noticed that the film formation remained quick. In addition to our work in the laboratory, we found one research article of interest. In this research, the ability of gelatin containing cellulose nanocrystals to extend the shelf life of strawberries was studied. The authors came to the conclusion that the mixture was effective for protecting fresh strawberries during the storage period. 
Based on these studies, CNC was added in the agar wax solution in order to extend the freshness of the cucumber. During the experiments, other cellulose-based materials were also tested for off film, such as CMC and MCC. However, most led to a thick gel texture, weak bonds or slow film formation. Upon numerous experiments, we were able to create the optimal dip solution composition of 2.2% agar, 0.1% CNC and 0.03% wax in water. With this solution maintained at a temperature of 45 degrees Celsius, we managed to obtain a solid film formation in 17 seconds. This is how our new liquid packaging solution DeepRap was born. DeepRap is a liquid packaging solution that forms a biodegradable, non-toxic and visually appealing film that can be easily peeled off. In the first 24 hours or so, the film acts as an aqueous environment and a shock-absorbing layer during transportation. Also, CNC can act as an efficient antimicrobial agent, making the film ideal for preserving fresh products. All properties that cannot be achieved with a conventional shrink wrapped packaging. This product is designed to be applied at an industrial scale, but targeting three sub-levels. The industrial level with its efficiency and fast solid film forming time of 17 seconds, the commercial level with its longer shelf life, and the consumer level with its easy removal design and biodegradability. When envisioning our product at an industrial scale, this packaging liquid has to be heated only to 50 degrees Celsius and mixed gently in order to avoid solidifying. These conditions are mild in comparison with industrial production lines in general. As CNC is a relatively new material, we must work in parallel with the current pioneers of research in nanoscience to ensure its full safety. One main issue is the cost of our product. Agar and CNC are expensive compared to polyethylene used for shrink wrapping. This will inevitably affect the price of packaging of cucumbers in the beginning. However, when oil prices keep on rising and when the growing sell rate of the dip wrap enables cheaper production of CNC, it could possibly reach a wide sphere of consumers in the future, and not only the climate conscious population. We have also been researching more efficient and environmentally friendly substitutes for agar agar as well as carnauba wax. These alternative ingredients ensure dip wraps positive impact on the environment and the people, so that the ingredients used would not cause, for instance, eutrophication through overharvesting of seaweed. Our goal is for eco-friendly packaging to be more accessible around the globe. Not only does our product reaffirm the recent trends in environmentally conscious consumption habits, but it also allows the current research being done on eco-packaging to be accessible at a wider level by interweaving into the consumer's everyday lifestyles. Unlike shrink wrapping, dip wrap can also be used as small-scale local farms without extensive machinery which allows for packaging solutions for local farmers to promote local food production. The dipping solution could also be used for other vegetables and fruits to prolong their shelf lives, berries being one of the foods with the shortest lifespan. The prolonged shelf life would decrease food waste, which is another major environmental concern. The global pandemic has not only confirmed the devastating human effects on the environment, but has also sharply raised the hygiene standards. Cellulose-based packaging materials would be one of the keys to working alongside the world's development and circumstances. The world is trying to reduce single-use plastics through creating global efforts such as United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and EU's limiting of plastic products. One method of limiting some single-use plastics will be through consumer awareness and new labeling requirements. Our product fully supports this directive as it provides a novel alternative for single-use plastic item. DipRap, with its unique liquid application, contributes to raising awareness of the issue beyond to cultures where the negative consequences of plastic packaging are not yet widely acknowledged. Working on this project together has sparked fresh design ideas of approaching the same issue. What if we could innovate even more ways to use DipRap? Could the material be collected and reused instead of recycled as bio-waste? Could dip wrap be sprayed instead of dipped? What if the packaging could also be used to seal a half-cut cucumber? We find so much inspiration from the everyday and infinite potentials of this product. 
For us at Scumber Inc., our goal is to make sustainable packaging the new standard for the 21st century. We would like to encourage the industry, as well as the consumers, to be conscious of their everyday choices and to encourage people in their community to do the same. We want to create a new market for eco-friendly products and packaging and inspire other companies to follow in our footsteps. Jet wrap might be the first baby step, but you know, all changes must start somewhere small. So, so let's all take a small step together today for a better tomorrow. Awesome job to the dip wrap team. Congratulations. Um, so our sixth finalist team is Permapack, but since we played their video earlier, we're not going to be playing it again. So we are going to be stopping for a quick break until 1230. And when we get back, we'll be hearing from our first speaker, Janina Jeff. In a world where plastic rules all, 90% of toys are made of some sort of unrecyclable plastic. Our brave biomaterial rebels, Fungus and Scooby, have come to save our planet. Together, they will battle the evil forces of plastic. But wait, they can't do it alone. Join their mission of ridding the world of plastic, one BioBuddies kid at a time. We're the BioBuddies! Our mission is to provide you with eco-friendly toy kits to explore, play, grow, and create with biomaterials. As the world is becoming more aware of environmental sustainability, it's time to move away from plastic. This is where biomaterial design comes in to save the day. Our biomaterial growing kit incorporates science, nature, and art to make biodesign more approachable. We've designed two biomaterial growing kits, Scooby and Fungus. Scooby is a kombucha growing kit, and Fungus is a mycelium kit. Each kit includes the necessary supplies to grow the biomaterial and explore with it. The average toy fad lasts eight months. Our goal is to create a sustainable kit that can be played with, explored, and developed to sustain interest over a long period of time. The entire exploration journey cycle is accessible, educational, and fun. We tap into the waste stream by feeding our cultures with used coffee grounds, sugary drinks, and tea leaves. First, users grow their biomaterials. Then they can play and explore through personalized projects with their materials. Of course, not all projects will succeed so we encourage users to celebrate their fails. In the future, we hope that we can sell our kits online or even in retail stores like Target to people of all ages. As our kits don't fit into a specific category, we think that they would best fit into the craft or miscellaneous kit aisle. Help us save the earth by redesigning the toy industry. Bio, Bio Buddies out!
자라면 딸들도 요리 잘하거든? 그래서 우리 외할머니가 요리를 진짜 잘하셨고 우리 이모도 요리를 진짜 잘하셨어 엄마의 그런 따뜻함을 먼저 떠올리는 거지. 엄마가 이렇게 만들어줬다는 그런, 그런 느낌? 엄마가 나를 위해서 신경을 써줬다. 엄마가 나를 사랑한다. 그런 느낌이 제일 많고. 글쎄, 하면 타고났겠죠, 손맛은? 자기가 뭐 태어날 때부터, 그죠? 자기가 좋은 손맛을 가지고 있다는 거는 좋은 재산을 가지고 있는 거랑 마찬가지잖아요. 
ร้องไห้แต่คลายชายเจ้าน้ำตาเสียงนี้เสียงคนปวดใจที่ร้องควรหาใจจะหลบหน้าไปไหนใจจะเป็นคนเศร้ามองฉันต้องเหมือนคนสิ้นใจหรือลืมสัญญาที่เคยให้ไว้ฉันจะไม่รักใครฉันไหนถึงคิดว่าจะ Hi I'm Dan I'm Vina I'm Alex And I'm Emma, and we're the team behind BioDesign Challenge. We want your help to publish our first ever book, BioDesign Challenge: A Retrospective. BDC is an international education program and competition that's shaping the first generation of biodesigners. We pair high school and university students with artists, designers, and scientists to envision, create, and critique transformational applications in biotechnology. Our projects have gone on to show in museums and galleries around the world, and many have served as inspiration for new companies. The book will be a full-color celebration of work produced by the BDC community over the last five years. It will feature 28 projects that bridge art, design, and biotechnology. Not only will it include essays by our alumni, but perspectives from eminent practitioners in the field. Newcomers will find a primer on bio design and how it's shaping the future of sustainability. For those already familiar, the book will offer insights from thought leaders, including biologist Paul Fremont, curator William Myers, and many others. It'll also include a foreword by Paula Antonelli, senior curator of architecture and design at MoMA. BDC has collaborated with organizations including Science Sandbox, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Parsons School of Design, and the Museum of Modern Art, where we hold our annual summit. We're publishing the book in partnership with the University Science Center in Philadelphia. So, if you're interested in learning more about innovative and fascinating topics, or if you just want to be awesome and support the next generation of bio designers, then this book is for you. Every pledge, no matter how big or small, helps bring us closer to our goal. Thank you for your support. We can't wait to share the retrospective with you. Thank you.
now in the portion of our program where we're going to have some wonderful speakers. Uh, so our first speaker, I'd like to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Janina Jeff. Janina is a scientist and science journalist with an international award-winning podcast called In Those Genes, which uses genetic genetics to decode the lost histories and futures of African descendants. Mm -hmm. She is the first African-American to graduate with a PhD in human and medical genetics from Vanderbilt University. Her research has focused on population genetics, specifically studying descendants with African ancestry and discovering population specific risk factors for disease. Janina is currently a senior bioinformatics scientist at Illumina. Thank you so much for joining us, Janina. We are so excited to have you and I will let you take the mic when you're ready. Yes, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm so excited about today's event and the biodesign challenge. I have learned so much from the previous years and the projects that have won. It's such an honor to speak to you today about my work and the things that I am doing. I'm going to share my screen. Um, one second. Sorry, just give me a second while I'm getting things together over here. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to talk to you today about the work that I've been doing. Um, mostly through the arts, uh, but I want to talk a little bit about the science and, and really how I got here and hopefully can, you know, inspire you as I'm sure most of you are already inspired if you're here today um, to continue the work that you're doing in, in, in the intersection of science and the arts. So I want to start with kind of where my journey began. In particular, in particular, how my journey began in the context of In Those Genes, which is the podcast, um, it was, it was just a podcast that I, have, that I host. 
And I'll talk more about the podcast later, but it really started with this question and people asking me, what are you? What are you? And a few years ago, it came to me that one, the question was extremely offensive. And what people were really trying to ask me was what was my racial or ethnic identity? And this obsession with how we obsess over how different we are by using these racial categories or the system of human hierarchy. So throughout the talk, I'm going to play different clips from the podcast, but I want to play this clip as I think it relates to a lot of people who have been asked this question and some of the assumptions that are made about us. Uh, just because I'm tall and black doesn't mean I'm somehow gen- Oops. Sorry, I just realized that I shared my screen and did not hit the optimize buttons. Okay, but they were already hit. Sorry. (laughs) Oh, technology. Okay, I'm back. All right. We program to play basketball. So what do you mix with anyway? Are you Spanish? You from Africa? Like where where are you from? You you feel baby? My hair curly because I got Indian in my family. What the baby? What, what you mean? So that's just a clip from voices throughout the community of different slurs, different phrases, different questions that people are asked on the street. And now, you know, now, now when people ask me that question, I like to start here. I like to remind everyone that. I'm actually, I'm human, just like you. And most importantly, that we are more alike than we are different. In fact, about 99% of our genomes we share amongst each other. And I am a geneticist. And so I, at this point, started to really make the connections between the genome and between our social lives, between how we live in society and how genetics becomes a part of our social life, our, our socialization. Uh, in both positive and negative ways. But when I say that we're 99% the same, you're probably like, well, what do you mean by that? And and what exactly is a genome? And so I want to play this clip of what a genome is. And genes are what make us us. So everybody has the same genes. As much as we try to think one person has a gene for this and the other person has a gene for that, we all have the same 25,000 genes. But what makes it different are the four letters that make up these genes, and that's called DNA. So those four letters or these four chemicals are adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. And for short, we call them A, T, C, and G. And so the sequence of these letters is what makes one gene different from the next gene. And within the same gene, you can have a different sequence between different individuals. So I told you guys we're 99% the same, so we have the same genes, but some of our genes may have an A where someone else has a T, and that's what makes us different from each other. Now, genome is a term that refers to your entire gene pool. Now we're talking about all 25,000 genes. We use it as a cohesive term to distinguish it from talking about a particular gene per se. For the sake of explanation, think about your genome as a bowl of rice. The entire bowl is your genome and every spoonful are your individual genes. So we know each bowl of rice has 25,000 spoonfuls or genes. So that is a overview of what a genome is. And it really, oops, sorry. It really started with this idea of a genome Um, that really helps people conceptualize what it is that makes us us. And so when I said that we were 99% the same, that means there's only 1% of our genome that distinguishes us from each other. And so while we use categories like race, while we use categories like religion and all these things, uh, the way we look to try and make differences that really don't exist from a scientific or a genetic standpoint. And to even highlight that, I have a picture of myself here and showing how similar my genome is to other species. And so you can see our nearest relative, we have 98% similarity. That means of the billions of letters, those A, T, C, and Gs that make up our DNA, we share the same sequence of those letters with different species. And if you can see even species who you would think that we're not so closely related to, 
like a fruit fly, for example, where a lot of biology and, and cellular biology research, they are conducted in fruit flies because of that similarity um, and eventually can be applied to humans. And so we are more alike than we are different, as Maya Angelou likes to say. But it really is the differences that have cultivated me into considering myself what I call a geneticist, which is how I use the genome to really answer questions that could help the community. And so the genetics part of me, um, my formal training as a scientist, really understands how we can use the genome and not just use the genome um, to understand differences, which are very minute, but see how those small differences could help explain things like disease and potentially could help be a justification of why we want to use the genome to predict our future or to ensure our futures. And then I say, geneticist. And this is really a, a cultural antidote, really speaking to uh, me as a Black woman and understanding the complexity of being a scientist, but also being a Black woman in the world. And so it really is kind of like this double consciousness, as I call it, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, that has really cultivated this career that I like to say, I kind of call myself a steaminist, but a steam activist. And I really want to highlight the A here that stands for arts, because since then, I have taken my career and evolved into a career of science communication. Um, because there is a lot of conflict when it comes to science and diverse communities, and I'll talk about a lot of the reasons why, I developed a science communications platform to really help um, decolonize, really, the science language, but also to help community engagement and involvement and engagement with science to make sure that science is diverse and representative. And so in 2018, I applied for a program at Spotify called the Sound Up Bootcamp. And this program had 18,000 people apply. And it was women of color from all across the world or in the US, I should say. And we were all applying for an opportunity to start a podcast. Now, at this point, I had never started a podcast before. I had been doing some public speaking, but I'd never started a podcast. I had also been doing some um, op-ed writing. Uh, I have a piece in The Root magazine called 46 Chromosomes in a Mule, which really talks about... Um, an ancestry commercial ad that falsely romanticizes a relationship between a black woman and a white man, where we know genetically for that not to be true. In fact, that relationship was much more complicated and, and, and more full of trauma. I also have done speaking engagements such as my TED talk, where I talk about how we can use the genome um, to leverage generational wealth and how we can create generational wealth and how we can change the narrative of how genetics research is being done right now in um, underrepresented populations. But I really want to talk about my podcast. That is my pride and joy. That is my art. That is what I hold uh, close and dear to my heart. My creative spirit gets to use. And so my podcast in those genes really was birthed out of that question, what are you? And it led to me giving a lot of converse, a lot of speaking engagements, but ultimately me realizing that there is a need to talk about genetics and to talk about how we learn genetics and the language in which we learn genetics. And so what we call everyone, our listeners, the families, so for those of you listening today, hearing me speak, you are now officially a part of the In Those Genes family. Please go on to your favorite podcast, um, listening app, subscribe to us, write us a note. But our podcast, we make genetics accessible using Black culture analogies, and we have conversations with kindred spirits. Our first season, called 46 Chromosomes in a Mule, centers on um, using commercial genetic testing like 23andMe and Ancestry, the education on how the tests are done, privacy, um, how we should be engaging with this test, how our community feels about this test, these tests, and really goes into a deep dive of all of the options in season one. And now we are in the process of developing season two. One of the things that I'm most proud about in terms of our podcast is that we are a science podcast and we're not just a science podcast. While we do a lot of science education, we also do a lot of historical education. We also bring in a lot of the arts and the arts in a podcast form is expressed by music. 
So we are a growing team. Now we have um, several black creatives that are a part of our team. And uh, you can't really see in the picture, but our lead producer, Sam here, is holding this amazing international award that we got from Third Coast. And so since developing our podcast, we've been extremely successful. I like to call us a very niche podcast. Like I love underground hip hop, which is a super big part of the show. I kind of consider us an underground hip hop science podcast, but we have gotten a lot of notoriety or what I like to call street cred um, with some very major um, audiences, including the Third Coast International Audio Festival and the American Society of Human Genetics. And really what is the bread and butter of what makes our podcast and my art so unique is that I am extremely passionate about decolonizing the language of science. And so when we think about traditional science and we think about the barriers that exist, you must have a PhD, you must, you know, attend this school, you must be able to conduct this scientific research. I strongly believe just like our ancestors that came from Africa, they were scientists too. In fact, they were pretty great scientists because if it wasn't for their survival, we wouldn't be here. And so I like to think that now the language, even the journal articles that we read, um, the books that have been published on how to educate people about science and genetics are all mostly written in English. Most scientific conferences are in English, and most of them um, are in the ac traditional academic culture, which is largely full of white supremacy, full of patriarchy, full of capitalism. And so one of the things that we're really passionate about it in those genes is how do we decolonize the language of science? And so this is an example of how we do that. Um, and in my full-time job, I am recently promoted to a staff scientist at Illumina, and I create technology that really helps us interrogate the genome, looking for that 0.1% that makes us different, and how can we leverage that to understand the relationship between the genome and disease? Now, what I talk about um, on the show and what I talk about even at my day job is why we need to include diversity. Why is it important that we have technology that is not just um, Eurocentric just because those are the samples that we have access to to study? Why is it important for us to really understand um, the complete diversity of the human genome? And so in this example, um, this might seem very foreign to you, but that's okay because I'm going to play a podcast clip that really emphasizes that. But what I'm showing here is a technique called fine mapping. What fine mapping means is that we see a signal that's associated with a disease. In this picture at the top panel, this would be anything that is above the dotted line. All of these little dots here are associated with a disease. And what we don't know is which of these dots is the variant that is causing the disease. And so if we're looking in a European population and the colors are talking about how similar these variants are to each other. So we're looking at a European population. We see that all of these variants, which are represented in this lower panel here, are very similar. They all look alike. In fact, if we go and zoom in on this plot, we can't tell which dot is which. And that is because of this event that happens in human populations called admixture. And so when we inherit parts of our genome from our ancestors from a particular region or country, typically they travel together, they're buddies, they like to travel together. And so when we're trying to see an association with the disease, all of these variants travel together, they all look alike, we can't tell them apart. But if we look at an older population, and that population has had time to develop diversity, we can see a little bit clearer what that, what that disease variant might be. And so as you can see, once you come down, you can see that this signal that has all of these variants can now be narrowed down to one variant or two variants in a more recent population that has gone through admixture or an older population that has a lot of variability so that we can distinguish one variant from another. Now, if you didn't understand that, that is completely okay because that is the goal of In Those Genes podcast. This is the language that we use to talk about science, but really this concept and the concept of science in general existed long before the English language, right? Existed long before we developed this idea of academia and PhDs. And so one of the things that we really are passionate about is decolonizing the language of science and how do we be more inclusive, particularly with the black community of using language that, um, that is relevant to us, that conceptualizes a concept. And so this is me teaching the same concept on the podcast. 
Spine mapping is a way that allows scientists to look at the genome and determine exactly where variations that cause disease arise. To explain this further, pack your bag, grab your snacks, get that aux cord. We're going on a road trip. Well, two road trips, actually. But the same destination, kind of. The destination is the cure to a disease, and we're traveling along the genome to get there. I feel like like we're taking steps on like a DNA helix. <laughs> we're just like, ah. The first road trip, we're opening up our navigation app called Euromaps. It's a map of the human genome based on European samples. Folks of European descent split off from folks of African descent about 40,000 years ago. Because of this split, their genome holds a lot less variation than folks of African descent, an older and more admixed population. Less variation means less information about the history of humanity. That means that Euromaps is a little vague, like Siri on a rainy day. So we're on our road trip, and Euromaps is just saying, I think it's the next left. No, 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 right, wait, no, it's left. Go left, go left. Or make a right at the light, then go down for about four or five minutes until you see an old man with a dog. Yeah, that's the one, the Pomeranian. It has some idea where we're going, but the directions are far from precise. So we pull up to our final destination and Euromaps yells out, Ah, oh, yes, I think this is it. Well, actually, I mean, I don't know. It kind of looks familiar. And we're standing in an empty parking lot. Euromap says, It's in the neighborhood. I'm sure of it. And we can spend days, hours, years, even decades figuring out just where in this neighborhood the cure to our disease is. Or we can use Afro maps. Afromaps is based on a ton of information amassed over hundreds of thousands of years of variation in the African genome. It's the root of where all other genomes begin. So it not only has information of its own genomes, but also the genomes of others. So Afromaps is precise, like... In a quarter of a mile, take a slight right onto MLK Boulevard. Continue on to Flatbush Ave for two miles. Then make a left after the light. No, back up. You passed it. You gotta make a U-turn. All right, your destination is on the right. You've reached the disease cure right between the red house and the green house. It's the black one right there in the middle. Yeah, with the grill out front. We hop out and see exactly where in the genome the cause of our disease is, and we can begin making drugs to assess the problem. I mean, imagine all the time, energy, and gas we didn't use on Euromaps when we could have just used Afro Maps and got there on a half a tank in under two hours. Talk about efficiency. This is just an abbreviated version of the complexity of mapping. So that's an mapping. example. But I think the real question that I think most of us and even myself wanted to know is why do we even have to do this? Why do we have to decolonize the science language? Um, and that really stems from our history. There is a history of medical exploitation and stigmatization in the Black community. And this picture is an example of that. This is a picture taken during the Tuskegee experiments. And one of the things that is really important about this picture is that it's in color. I think a lot of people make this assumption that this history um, is something that is so far in the past. And while it did originate um, long, long time ago, it wasn't so far in the past as we once thought. Just to give an example, what are some of the first encounters with the medical system that kind of have started to shape the reason why we might need to decolonize science is our access to medical care. For a Black person in this country, you typically went to, to seek medical care in one or two instances. One, you were too sick to work. And um, two, you were used for medical research. And that has been what has shaped the Black community in America and our engagement with science and the healthcare industry. Another example of that is Henrietta Lacks. If you're not familiar with Henrietta Lacks, Henrietta Lacks, oops, sorry, I wasn't supposed to start playing that yet. <laughs> Henrietta Lacks um, is 
is a black woman who contributed to science in a very significant way without her consent. Um, I'm running a little short on time. So if I have time, I'll come back to play this clip of Henrietta Lacks. But for those of you who don't know, Henrietta Lacks um, was diagnosed with ovarian cancer and her cancerous cells were extracted and were used for research. And so we can thank Henrietta Lacks, who unfortunately passed away in her 30s, um, for things like the sequencing of the human genome, eradication of polio, creating HPV vaccines. And in some cases, these quote unquote HeLa cells were even used to create some of the COVID va COVID-19 vaccines. We learned that we have 23 chromosomes. We wouldn't even know there would be no 23 in me if it wasn't for Henrietta Lacks. But there are a lot of things that we learned from Henrietta Lacks. And it's interesting because in terms of my complex relationship or what I like to call my double consciousness, I had only heard of Henry, I had not heard of Henrietta Lacks, but at the time as a young scientist, I had heard of HeLa cells. And so HeLa cells are one of the most like infamous human cell lines that are used in cell biology almost in every lab. And it was really disappointing to me that even myself, a person who was getting a PhD at the time, didn't know that the history of the word HeLa cells stemmed from Henrietta, the first two letters of Henrietta's first and last name, Henrietta Lacks. So that just goes to show you that there's a lot that even a Black scientist who is in this field has to learn, therefore, the structures that we have to learn. And even in 2017, Mount Sinai had a statue of J. Marion Sims. For those of you who are not familiar with J. Marion Sims, he is quote, he was called the father of gynecology, but really controversial. Um, J. Marion Sims was um, doing surgical procedures on Black women. Um, obstetrics, gynecology, surgical procedures on Black women without anesthesia under this assumption that was based out of pseudoscience that Black women um, experience less pain. And there's no thing, there's no, there's no, that didn't just pop from out of the sky. There are a lot of baseless facts within science that really kind of set the stage for why these injustices exist. Unfortunately, and these are just an example of some of them, um, including, you know, Black people experience less pain. And so there really is a need for In Those Genes podcast to, one, dismantle a lot of fact from fiction in the Black community to continue and create this relationship between the Black community and the research community. But this goes just beyond knowledge and education. We also see this impact when we look at research studies. And so what I'm showing you is the most common, really population scale genetic studies that we call GWAS. And in each color are the populations of people who are represented in these studies. If you look at this graph, up until 2018, even, and there's some updates of this graph, majority of the population studied are European. However, if we look at the global representation of populations across the world, Europeans make up a small fraction of that. In fact, East Asian and South Asians uh, dominate the amount, uh, the percentage of people um, represented in the world. And this has huge consequences because when we use European individuals in research studies and we try to take what we learn in research studies into clinical practice, while we're 0.1% the same, the 0.1% that makes us different sometimes has clinical impact. And that clinical impact, if not studied in all populations, has huge consequences. And so this is an example of one of those, uh, a finding for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in European descent individuals originally being applied to African descent individuals. And essentially what happened is people who have these variants are considered to have this disease. When we look at African populations or black populations, we see that they do not have um, this disease despite having these variants. And so there's huge genetic consequences. And these consequences go beyond genetics and even into um, clinical informatics. And so without going into the detail here, this is a field that is trying to use bioinformatics and AI to really improve our healthcare system. How can we predict who's going to get sick? How can we predict who gets the most medication? Um, or who gets what medications at this time and who are eligible for certain studies versus others. And even when we look at these systems and we're trying to look at, you know, what are the differences between populations, we notice that you can even see inherent racism coming out. And in this example where we're showing people um, the total medical expenditure, which is one of the things that are used 
to determine how sick a person might be, if they should be included in a clinical trial or should get a, a more treatment, we see that it is not corrected by race. In fact, when we look at how much money is actually spent, even though Black people are sicker, less money is being spent because of access to health care. When we talk about our drugs, even, we can use diversity in order to help us understand how we can create drug targets. In particular, when I was talking about that, um, that, um, that technique called fine mapping, we can think about variants that are unique to a certain population and use those variants to create drug targets. And that doesn't only benefit the population that we're studying, but it benefits all populations. And so there is a lot of work that we have to continue to do to understand the differences. But one of the things that we have to do in order to continue this relationship, in addition to decolonizing the language of science, we have to change our entire ecosystem. So that goes to including diverse samples in the research that we do. That goes to taking the language that I'm doing in the podcast and changing that language and educating a community, making sure they're inclusive. That also goes to ending transactional research where scientists have this very transactional relationship with the participants that they need to answer these questions in diverse populations, including diversifying the workforce. And so this is published earlier this year, talking about the difficulties for Black scientists to get funding. And that's really important because Black scientists like myself, we have a deeper insight talking about that double consciousness that I spoke of earlier, we understand the complex relationship between being a Black person in America, as well as its scientific need. And so Black scientists really do need to have access to research funding to better study health disparities at its full spectrum, not just genetics, but thinking about what are the social implications that impact genetics? What are the cultural implications? I talked about a Black person's first engagement with the medical and healthcare system. Is that something that's passed on? And so, like I said, I use my science to um, dismantle uh, and decolonize the language of science. And I have a lot of clips in here that I won't be able to talk to, but please listen to the podcast. All these clips can be found in the podcast. But there really is um, a need to take something like your art and continue to create a village for people who are in need of one and continue to diversify the area of STEM. And so through my work, through podcasting, through my work, through science, through my work, through mentorship and in community engagement, it all is connected to the arts to science and to the community and our culture. And this is just a little bit of some of the work that I've been doing. I wanna end with this last clip of a student of mine, my first mentee in New York, who um, is a descendant, uh, an immigrant descendant from North Africa. And talk about, you know, I, I wanna show this clip of my the, the last day of my mentorship with her when she got accepted into her dream school. Is that oh, okay. Right, it on. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. And that's a lot of screaming in the background. One of the reasons why that day was so important to me is because this young woman came from a family whose parents did not want her to go to college, who really, really did not want her to even apply for college. And so it was through the mentorship and the community that she found through diverse programs and communities like the bio design challenge that really had cultivated and created a village for her to give her the support to go on and pursue her dreams. And she's now graduated from Penn. Um, she went to Penn on a full scholarship. Okay. And that's the end of my talk. I hope this inspires you to continue to use your art to solicit change, um, social change and social justice in this world. And Thank you so much for the invitation. And I'm so excited to see the winners of today's challenge and uh, super proud of all the work that you're doing at BioDesign. Thank you, Janina. That was a wonderful talk. Thank you for joining us. And of course, thank you for all the work that you do. Um, I'm gonna ask you to stop sharing your screen. Thank you. And I'm gonna invite Kathy High and Lisa Marganelli up to the stage, I'm gonna introduce you to. Kathy is a renowned interdisciplinary artist and educator at RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. She's the head of the art department, a professor of video and new media, and oversees a lab at the Biotech Center. 
She is project coordinator for Nature Lab Urban Environmental Education Center at the Center at the Sanctuary for Independent Media. She's also a mentor and a friend and has been really promoting a lot of the work that we do at Biodesign Challenge since day one and even before then when we were at GenSpace. So I, I'm so happy to have Kathy with us today. Lisa is senior editor at Issues in Science and Technology. She's the author of Underbug and Oil on the Brain. We've been working with Lisa over the last year to highlight some of the projects from Biodesign on uh, in Issues in Science and Technology, and it's just been an utter pleasure to work with her. Uh, I'm going to not take any more of your time. I just want to thank you both for joining us, and I'm going to turn off my camera. Go ahead. Hello. Um, it's really a tremendous pleasure to be here at Biodesign. Uh, as Dan said, I, I watch or have been paying attention to all of your projects over the past year as we as we promote them on, on issues. Um, and then it's a, just an enormous pleasure to get to participate and to watch all of the work that you've been doing and all of the thinking and the, I am uh, intrigued. I, I feel happy when I see biodesign projects, not because they're happy projects, but because we're taking some active role in thinking about our future and thinking about the, the world and the joining of technology and art that we are doing and instead of just like letting it fall on us. Um, and so uh, let me turn to Kathy High, um, who has been thinking about how do we keep the world from falling on us for many, many years? Um, she is, uh, her art has been uh, exploring all sorts of fascinating things. Um, and it's kind of driven by a feminist queer sensibility, an interest in a dialogue between art and technology, as well as um, community engagement, very deep community engagement. And we'll sort of get to that at the end. Um, she's also, well, let me just back up. So when microbiologists talk or when people, biologists talk about uh, the deep past, they talk about a uh, Luca, Luca, last universal common ancestor. Four billion years ago, something came to life. There was a little twist of DNA and something more. And then it began to reproduce and suddenly there was life and we all have some like commonality back to that space. Um, Kathy is has a universal common ancestor quality in the bio art space. There are a lot of people who've been, who've worked closely with her, been inspired by her, bounced off of her ideas. Um, among these people are Pia Interlandi, Heather Dewey Hagborg, Ellie Irons. Um, she introduced me to someone who does ant music um, named Lisa Schoenberg, which I turn on the ant music when I'm when I need some ant music. Um, so, uh, <laughs> Kathy, very nice to talk to you. Um, I was thinking, let's just get started with rats. How did you get interested in rats? Well, thank you so much, Lisa. And it's such a pleasure to be here, as you said. And thanks to the Biodesign Challenge for inviting me. And also, likewise, I've been part of the Biodesign Challenge since the beginning, uh, watching Dan create this amazing space here for students. And also now this team he has with him is just stellar. So I'm really proud to be here and it's really a pleasure to talk to you. I love your book, Underbug, by the way, just to promote that. So going back to rats. So yeah, I mean, I a lot of my work comes, to, comes from, uh, you know, looking at my own body and thinking about what is going on with my own diseases and things like that. I think all of us have this sort of firsthand information very intimately with what we are dealing with. And for myself, I became interested in rats, partly because I started to get really interested in what research was taking place on their bodies. They're like these um, model, you know, scientific models and products that are used within research. And I, and I got really intrigued with how many of them are used and how come I didn't know about this. I didn't know anything about this until I started sort of looking into the, the pipeline. Let's put it that way. Okay. Because a lot of this, this research is kept hidden, invisible. Mm -hmm. So that's partly what got me interested in rats. <laughs> and then where did it take you? I mean, uh, when I look at your page, there's all kinds of rat work and different, you had maybe 15 years of evolving 
relationships with rats and you, you have Tomagotchi rats and you have white chocolate rats, but you also have real rats. Can you tell me a little bit about how, so let's just back up for a second. How many, how many lab rats are there right now? Nobody knows. Okay. I think you mentioned totally million. Yeah, it, there's guesstimates at something like that, but really they're not really counted because there are many different um, universities, research centers, et cetera, that use rats, mice, and birds as uh, subjects among other, uh, other animals. And we don't really know how many are used. So basically so, every molecule that's getting tested for any use, it ends up being given to a rat essentially to see how the rat reacts to it or a collection of rats, hopefully, uh, reacts to it. And then that is used as kind of a proxy for the human experience of that molecule. Yeah, so I think that's, that's a good definition of it. And yep, it's running exactly. at the rate of maybe 80 million human rat futures a year. Totally crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us about your rats. So, <laughs> so, well, I just remembered the other day that actually some of the first rats I'd ever encountered were uh, some students of mine had dyed their rats, their albino rats pink for a shoot, and they were going to throw them out or something. And I was like, no, 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 wait, let me take these rats. So this was a number of years ago. So I actually had some experience with them. Um, but the rats that I ended up getting for this project called Embracing Animal were rats that were used in this kind of research that I was talking about. So they were used for autoimmune diseases and developed to be sick for treating rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel diseases, et cetera. And I was able to just kind of, at the time, slightly under the, under the radar, um, order some and start to work with them. And I had these theories and they're totally, you know, not scientific, but I was interested in looking at, at, sort of it, from a perspective of a humanist, what happens to these rats if we take them out of the lab and start treating them alternatively? That's what I was doing with myself. I wasn't having a lot of success with the medical system in treating things like my Crohn's disease that I have. And I kind of started things like um, acupuncture a long time ago. And they that started to work. And even my doctors were like, why is this working? And I'm like, can't I can't tell you, but it is. So I thought maybe we could start working with the rats that way and doing some of these experiments. It, it, it did kind of work. It wasn't a controlled situation. I don't have any real statistics, but basically the rats basically thrived. And it was an amazing situation to watch them um, so you know, become goal, individuals. So your goal was twofold. One was to make the sick rats healthy. And the other one was to experience the rats as individuals. Yeah. I don't think that um, just, I don't really think they could ever become healthy because they were bred to be sick. They could become healthier. Um, so that was one goal. And to give them the opportunity to explore spaces and foods and each other in ways that um, lab conditions don't allow. And these animals can't really exist just in the wild. We couldn't really release them because they do have these diseases. So they had to be cared for and we did care for them. And when I say we, this is in a situation where the rats were either with me at my house or in a, you know, lab uh, in a gallery or a museum and they were cared for by the curatorial team, by veterinarians, et cetera, et cetera, and myself. So it was, a, it was a labor of love by a lot of people to try and build these large spaces for them, enrich their lives, and make, make them, you know, just live their lives differently. That was one part of the uh, goal of the project. The other part of the goal of the project was to try and translate some of this work that the rats were doing for the public. So as you said, this work started a long time ago, and I had the rats in 2004 to 2006. Between that time, they were exhibited twice, but one of the exhibitions was at a, um, the, the Mass Mocha here in Western Massachusetts, which is a museum that puts on long-term exhibitions. So this was an exhibition about animals and human-animal relationships, and it was up for 10 months. So they estimated 10,000 people come through a month. So that's a lot of people who get to see this work. 
And the, they were really great at training their docents to be able to talk about transgenic animals. So the rats had human DNA so that they could carry the kinds of immune diseases, autoimmune diseases like my own. And so they were a little bit human. This is why I was attracted to them. They were a little bit like us or part of us. Mm -hmm. But in 2004, transgenics wasn't understood in the same way it's understood now. It's more ubiquitous. It's more out in the public, you know, and I think that it's easier for people to understand that term. At that point, it wasn't quite as new as well, well versed publicly. So the, the museum did a great job with their docents and the people who introduced the work to actually bring that term to the forefront and make people understand this kind of genetic work that we're doing with our research subjects. And that now extends to humans too, of course. But, um, you know, that we do that a lot with animals. I'll just say that. <laughs> I, I want to know a little bit about your relationship with the, the rats. I mean, there's a video on your site and there's a little rat comes up to the edge of a cage and squeezes. I can't do it because I don't have a rat nose, but the, squeezes, <laughs> the rat's nose squeezes over the wire on the cage and really seems to feel it. And you can even see the little nose sort of go down. And you really get this sense that the rat is doing something and it knows what it's doing and it has feelings and it's thinking, well, who knows what the rat's thinking? I won't impose any thoughts on the rat, but the rat is exploring that environment very intentionally. And, and then you think, oh, all these rats in all these cages. And I, I guess my question is, what is the role of empathy in this work that's on transgenic animals and rats and humans and technology? What, is it, what do you think the role of empathy is? I, I, I love that question because I think that, I think empathy is, is uh, one of the important things that we need to understand when we think about what I typically call as trash animals and by trash animals I mean animals that are really you know ones that we we don't really care if they live or not so rats uh, pigs coyotes you know these kinds of animals would be put into this term uh, under this term and I think that then we can even extend that to things like microbes and other other cellular beings or viruses and to develop a kind of care or concern that goes beyond the human, I think is really in, 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 in just imp incredibly important to be able to empathize with the, the, the world around us. And that includes people, of course, and all of the kind of disparities that we know are completely existing around us right now. Um, but to change the system and to structurally change the system, I think we have to have other kinds of ways of thinking. And this other, these other ways of thinking involve these kinds of interdisciplinary practices and, and, and looking at art, science, and humanities as part of a, a whole. So to get back to your question about that rat, that was Echo. And she was really great at sort of trying to get my attention when she wanted to get, we had this special little blueberry street that she loved. And she knew exactly how to get, you know, get me going and get her, get her that treat. And she was, she was incredibly smart. And, and while I, when I first got rats, I didn't like rats at all. I mean, I didn't, I don't, you know, I was not a fan. I didn't know what to do with them. By the end of this period living with them, I had basically fallen in love with each one differently because each one of them was different. Echo, Star, Matilda, Tara, and um, Flowers were the five that I had had. So they were, they were amazing as a team, and they taught me more than I ever taught them. I think that's really interesting. Um, I even saw that you did like sort of funerals for them, special funeral things. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, um, you know, you, you mentioned that empathy is not enough. And you need to have these sort of this interdisciplinary rubric to explore these things and, and to really work on how to create structural change. And a lot of that really comes from the social critique, which is so obvious when you're a, a judge or involved with bio design is like, what is social critique? Where do we do it? Why do we do it? What, what is our goal? Um, what are there's good kinds of social critique and bad kinds of social critique? And, you know, all, there's so many interesting questions in it, but what I, 
it struck me this morning, I was going to get, I get an inject, I have asthma, I get an injection every two weeks. And it struck me that we talk about bio design challenge with the metaphors and the proxies for humans and all of these things as though it's a futuristic project. But when you think about the rats, it is a project we've been involved with for 50 or 60 years. We, are, we live because we have this intense relationship with rats. And some of our biodesign, this, this is very much a biodesign project where the humans and the rats in a, don't quite collaborate. It's certainly, it's a very unequal relationship, but the, right. the passing of the molecules back and forth is a big deal. And yet at the same time, you know, in, in my job, I'm, I happen to be um, editing a piece about how rats don't actually translate to humans. I mean, we use them as a metaphor, but they don't, express genes in the same ways that we do. So it's kind of, it's an interesting thing that this has been going on for a long time. And the bio design is not, it's not necessarily futurist. It's just that it's been very much uncritiqued. It's right, very right. new social critique. Um, and so with that, uh, if you want to add, do you want to add something or I was going to move on to microbes? No, I just, th I think you're, you're right. I mean, I think that the one thing that's interesting about um, this kind of speculation into the future is that it allows us to create a space where you can begin to ask these questions, you yeah. know, whether it's through Afrofuturism, whether it's through science fiction, I think that there's a, you can create a space to critique things at a slight distance and it gives people, it affords the, 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 the audience can not feel quite as implicated sometimes. And that's, both bad and good. So I think that we have to think about what those situations do. At the same time, I think this kind of social critique within work is incredibly important. And one of the key things that we need to keep in mind as we go forward, especially art that provokes and or asks questions. So um, that's something that's important to me, yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about your work with microbiota. Uh, how did you get involved with, with that? Was that another thing where it was experiential and then it became kind of the social critique? Yeah. I, so it, it's, it's so funny you're t picking up these things. I'm sure I sound like a weirdo to everybody, but um, I, <laughs> good, great. Thank you. But I, but I really do, you know, that work came about because I had been working with cells, with immune cells, um, white blood cells. And then right about at the time I was doing that, there was all this research going on around the gut microbiome. And of course, having Crohn's disease and other things and all of this, I was fascinated by this and got fascinated also with fecal microbial transplants. So that, that is a process for those who don't know of taking poop from a healthy person and actually implanting it in a sick person so that it repopulates your gut with good bacteria and other things, hopefully. It doesn't always work, but in many cases and with some diseases, it works like a charm. So it's amazing. And I had never heard of that kind of a cure. I'd been through so many different, you know, uh, Tech, you know, the, the technologies around how to treat autoimmune diseases are really weird, and, as are the treatments. So to think about this, which is like a paradigm shift, a paradigm shift about how we look at medicine, because we're actually treating our bodies with our own bodily material. And that's, I know that that's been practiced in a lot of different medicine, but in this case, it's a very firsthand, you know, literally. So I found that fascinating and then i got further and in, interested in what's in that gut microbiome what is it what are the bacteria doing how do they live together and all of this kind of stuff and it's still super uh new even though the research has been going on for a long time in decades it's still we're still at the very tip of the iceberg which is really exciting what are, are there uncomfortable questions you're sort of pursuing with your art on the microbiome? Um, the, I guess one of them would be um, what happens with people's, uh, for, from different people's um, situations and diseases, disease types. Sometimes your, your, your gut is going to be stripped of 
a lot of bacteria, particular kinds of bacteria. If you've been treated with antibiotics over long periods of time repeatedly, that can happen too, not just from disease. Uh -huh. So what happens when that, when you look at the profiles of those guts it makes me really uncomfortable to think like how can we help to repopulate these people's guts Bio probiotics are great but i'm not sure that they're long lasting so uh, or have any effect so you know how are we going to do this and who's going to curate these bacteria that are going you know so-called going to go back into us and who's going to make those decisions so I, I think that it has to be a collective decision but that means changing this whole system, as Janina was talking about in her talk before, of trying to, what was the term she used, decolonize the language. It's the same kind of principle. We need to all be involved mm -hmm. in these kinds of practices, like a citizen science, where or, or community science, better, because not everybody's a citizen, where people can start being involved in these, in these decisions. And that is actually one of the interesting things about the fecal... Uh, trades is that they were done by sort of citizen scientists on their own and it became yep. like this sort of social movement um yep. i thought it was really interesting i think also uh you know here again just like with your work on rats you're making something that's invisible visible uh, i mean i love the fact that your uncomfortable question was not putting individual poos in honey in special glass jars which you actually <laughs> did in a museum <laughs> Um, yeah, okay, that's true. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, one of the things I find really interesting about the micro, the evolving sense of the microbiome is, the, is how it's um, kind of changing what it means to be human. You know, I was at one point I was interviewing a, a microbial ecologist and, and we were drinking coffee and he was talking about how, um, you know, we think as humans that we're telling that we want coffee or we want potato chips, but actually it could just be your gut saying like, hey, bring us coffee or bring us potato chips. Um, and there's sort of another thing, uh, Janina was talking about us having 25,000 genes, but we also have about 9 million genes, in uh, microbial genes inside us and outside us. And there's viruses attached to them and, and related to them. And so we, we end up being about, you know, 400 times bigger than we think we are, which is wild. I mean, there's sort of a, just as the rats are, and we're designed, you know, we're thinking about a new kind of life, this transgenic business, we're also becoming kind of diffuse. We're like a cloud of stuff and we don't quite know ourselves. Totally. And that also disrupts this whole, you know, kind of, European uh, thinking, you know, philosophy of the self and that we're on top of the, the heap of everything because we're not. We're made up of everything that's around us. We are a part of everything. And I think, it, again, it's, it, it really needs to be rethought and thought through in terms of how we look at our bodies, how we then look at everything around us because it's all leaking in and out all the time <laughs> we're a part of all of it and they're a part of us it's all leaking in and out <laughs> so this is going to require sort of a new kind of social critique in which the the individual human is not at the center of it i mean it, along with the decolonizing of the sort of yeah. strat stratification imaginary stratifications or um genetic classifications we're we're also going to have to um start kind of redefining what the unit is right yeah, yeah. like a kind of queer ecology mm -hmm. you know like what is it exactly um and queer in the sense of yeah you know the way we are using it today but also the way it also had traditionally been used as something that's different you know something that is a, a new look at this whole way we think about ecology so i think there's um a lot of opportunity there for yeah. work to, to rethink things. I, one of the things I really love is that you're doing so much work with sort of community outreach and how do you get, how do individuals become, I mean, to the extent that we are individuals, become um, you know, involved in this process of science and art and iteration and social critique and, yeah. and the designing of this ongoing relationship that we have. And tell us about your, um, what you're excited about working on right now. Well, I'm super excited because this very weekend, 
we are opening a community um, science lab in North Troy, which is where I teach at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And so this is separate from the university um, and it's a community project and a nonprofit with a group who are really wonderful, an amazing, huge group of people called the Sanctuary for Independent Media. We started as media activists and progressive media makers. And out, over time, we realized that we had to sort of also include this branch of ecology because it was becoming imperative that that become work that we do as well. So we have a low power radio station and produce podcasts. And it's really, really amazing. We have a weekly show, but we also are opening an environmental education center called Nature Lab. And that's what's happening this weekend. And we've spent, you know, the past few years and even during the pandemic, um, time collect, get, you know, grant writing, raising funds to open up this space, which is actually a little laboratory, like a, bi a biosafety level one laboratory in this incredibly, um, it's like one of the hardest hit areas in New York state in this community that we're in. And it's a project that has the laboratory on the first floor and then a group called the People's Health Sanctuary. We're all working on, and this is what's gonna go into the second floor, which is still being constructed. And this is a group that looks at healing and alternative healing and also trauma particularly. So I think that those two things coupled together, the science that we'll be practicing and the kind of skill sets that we'll be hopefully being able to review and curriculum and workshops. And all, then this, this look at what trauma has been caused to all of us through the pandemic, through the deaths of everybody who's passed in the pandemic and, and, all, and so on, the kind of social and justice social justice and environmental justice inequities. And the, the projects are looking at, you know, how to, how to think through these very deep concerns that I think we all share and um, train other generations to come aboard and be able to enter, you know, if they want to enter the corporate system, if they want to enter academia, this is another way to gain training outside of, you know, the, the school systems. So we're hoping this will work. We've been doing it for a number of years outside of the lab in just little workshops, but now we actually have this space and it's an incredibly beautiful project that makes me really happy that we're doing it. So go to mediasanctuary.org and you'll see that, you'll see all of that. <laughs> I think this evolution that you're talking about from art to art with the technology to art and communities, and you've got the communities of microbes and you've got the communities of humans. Uh, it's, you know, it's a really interesting evolution. Um, and, uh, and it helps us think about moving, um, moving well beyond empathy into, into some sort of action. Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. <laughs> Kathy, thank you so much. It's been a huge pleasure to talk to you. And, um, and uh, I hope that everyone can go to Kathy's website and see how uh, stunning some of this art is and, and, and watch the echo the rat put her little nose on the wire. <laughs> Lisa, thank you too. Really a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you both. That was so engaging. And I will never look at a, a rat the same way. So that was very fun. Um, so we're going to go into a very quick uh, 15 minute break before we go into our award ceremony where, where we will announce all of our winners. Um, and we'll, we'll see you in 15 minutes. Thank you all. Thank you again, Kathy and Lisa and Janina. We'll see you soon. Hi, I'm Dan. I'm Vina. I'm Alex. And I'm Emma, and we're the team behind Biodesign Challenge. We want your help to publish our first ever book, Biodesign Challenge, a retrospective. BDC is an international education program and competition that's shaping the first generation of biodesigners. We pair high school and university students with artists, designers, and scientists to envision, create, and critique 
transformational applications in biotechnology. Our projects have gone on to show in museums and galleries around the world, and many have served as inspiration for new companies. The book will be a full-color celebration of work produced by the BDC community over the last five years. It will feature 28 projects that bridge art, design, and biotechnology. Not only will it include essays by our alumni, but perspectives from eminent practitioners in the field. Newcomers will find a primer on biodesign and how it's shaping the future of sustainability. For those already familiar, the book will offer insights from thought leaders, including biologist Paul Fremont, curator William Myers, and many others. It'll also include a foreword by Paula Antonelli, Senior Curator of Architecture and Design at MoMA. BDC has collaborated with organizations including Science Sandbox, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Parsons School of Design, and the Museum of Modern Art, where we hold our annual summit. We're publishing the book in partnership with the University Science Center in Philadelphia. So, if you're interested in learning more about innovative and fascinating topics, or if you just want to be awesome and support the next generation of bio designers, then this book is for you. Every pledge, no matter how big or small, helps bring us closer to our goal. Thank you for your support. We can't wait to share the retrospective with you. I've been dancing since I was about four years old. Dance gave me a sense of confidence and this belief that I could do anything. My passion for math began in elementary school. But when I was a teacher, I saw how girls of color just don't think that math is for them. I want to shatter those barriers. And I think that dance can be that tool that can unlock that in them. Them from dance, we believe that girls of color can be our next generation of engineers, scientists, technologists, and dance breeds the confidence that we need our girls to have in STEM. During the summer program, girls create dance performances that incorporate both dance and tech that they showcase at the end of the program. That can be a projection that is displayed behind them while they're performing. Our girls learn how to come up with an idea and bring it to life. Just like dancing, learning the STEM concepts doesn't always come natural. There's parts of it that's confusing where they may not know which direction to go in or the circuit that they created doesn't work. Hmm. I'm confused. You don't know why it's not working. Are these tightened? Okay, wait. I got it. Now go to the other one, go to the other one. The level is on the other one. But it's when they overcome that hump and, and just push through, they become so proud of what they create. We want this sense of we're in this together and we're gonna create something awesome. Seeing girls who come to us shy, intimidated by science, transform during our program isn't surprising to me. always seen their potential, but when they see it themselves, that's powerful.
the third question that we had um, and that I've had for a very long time is how do you control an organism that you don't see um, given the protocol? So when we're working with this organism, you can't really see where these cells are going to land. So um, how do you contain it in a particular way so that we can start to explore print? And um, I guess uh, as an architect, one of the things that I used to really, um, I used to geek out about was line weights. And I'm still a little bit <laughs> obsessed with line weights and um, trying to understand what's the bare minimum we can derive from this process. Um, what does uh, 0.005 look like? <clears throat> Um, and so we explored with different methods uh, of understanding what that baseline is. And what's exciting about this particular example is um, it is the second iteration of that experiment. Now, <laughs> that's by uh, standards of um, making and learning and knowing your craft pretty bad. Um, but it took about a month and a half to set up the experiment, um, which involves a, not just uh, creating the infrastructure, the tools to be able to do it, um, but it also involves um, designing the choreography around how you're actually going to implement all of these layers together. <clears throat> and then you wait seven days, the life cycle of streptomyces cd color, um, <clears throat> and this comes out the other end. And it's, it's an amazing moment when you take it out of the Petri dish and go, wow, it kind of worked. It kind of looks kind of ugly, but it kind of worked. Um, and this is important because we also do have to get good at doing this. And so this question of how this work happens, where it happens is about longevity of infrastructure to allow a practice to develop beyond the building of the protocol to actually developing the craft practice itself. So we are not yet crafts women and men in this field, but we're trying. Um, a recent project we collaborated with UCL on is um, a commission for, uh, the, uh, by the Cooper Hewitt for the Triennale. <clears throat> This is a particularly exciting example of uh, the second generation of um, the assemblage coat, which um, is actually two coats. It's a reversible coat. It's gimmicky, but it's fun because actually what we did is to highlight all of the different protocols that we've been developing along the way. And so um, it's, it's almost an in-joke because um, I think I'm probably, if I look at my team, the only person who can pinpoint every single piece you see or um, imprint you see and know exactly how it was made. And so it's this roadmap um, that you can start to use to tell the story of uh, this protocol development. What's been incredibly important as well is the visual um, image making that we use to describe and to talk about these new value systems um, and where these interventions can live. I also just want to um, geek out about this sleeve. Um, that print that you see, that very straight line that you see, um, was completely unexpected, and it's a brand new protocol. And I think what Paula said about um, curators being able to give researchers time and space and funding to be able to push their practice is how something like this happens all these years later, a brand new protocol that you discover sometimes by accident. So I'm very excited about that line because it opens up a whole new aesthetic once we start to take that and implement it in different scales.
ask you, um, I know that you have called yourself a curator and reporter. Um, and as such, I'm just curious if you could answer the question that everyone was posed uh, at the invitation. So what is biodesign to you? Well, it, it, it's always a very, very, very big question because the first part of it is to understand what design is, which is impossible because it's a little bit like asking what art is. Um, and uh, biodesign, however, if we consider design as being a coming together of the of a goals and means towards this particular synthesis, biodesign makes tangible and understandable the biology that we cannot see. And through art, we can make it visible and, and even between quotes employable by the uh, rest of the world you know so it really is um, it really is about a way to bring nature into a design process that's existed for centuries and uh, my beloved friend Mary Oxman is online she just texted me and she's a master at that we can talk about uh, that afterwards and what she does afterwards but Truly, biodesign is the future, and uh, it is uh, a lot to me and a lot to the world, and that's what I aspire to explain. What about you? What is biodesign to you? <laughs> well, first of all, I'd just like to say I love how you frame it as making biology visible, the invisible components of nature visible, because biology, I think, as it's highlighted in a lot of your exhibits, is like how how can we interface with it at, at different scales? Because we have such a narrow lens as humans of what biology is. But I think I, I like that um, idea of making the invisible visible through design. Thank um, you. Yeah, I really love that. I think for me, um, as an educator, it's storytelling. So biodesign is storytelling and slow making at the intersection of um, with nature, at the intersection of design, culture. Uh, and of course, biology. So it's this intersectionality that you explore with storytelling and, and slow making because it takes time to grow. And how long ago did you start both practicing and teaching biodesign? <laughs> um, so I was introduced to biodesign, um, you know, contemporary biodesign uh, by Anya Schultz at uh, the Tech Interactive in San Jose. And they were, she was working with Microworks with mycelium. And I was so excited to see built structures that were grown in collaboration with organisms. And it was just so um, exciting. And that was only maybe three years ago. Us and everybody else, huh? But already it was just a few years ago, but it's amazing how far it's come, right? Yeah. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to Paula. You are amazing. You are all so wonderful. Thank you to our teachers. Thank you to our mentors. Thank you to everyone who's part of this community. Happy birthday, BDC. I'm looking forward to uh, next year's uh, challenge and, and looking forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. See you soon.
time has come. It's time to announce the prizes for this year's Biodesign Challenge 2021. Uh, I'm very happy to have Ana Rosales on stage with me, or virtual stage, if you will. She's the Director of Nutrition and Wellbeing at Barilla. Uh, as you all know, Barilla sponsored a prize this year, the Barilla Prize for Regenerative Living Ecosystems. And Ana has been instrumental in, in informing the students about the, the, the issues of food and agriculture that we need to overcome in the next 20, 30 years. Uh, and it's just been a pleasure, honestly, a pleasure to work with you and, and the team. Anna is gonna actually announce the award. I'm gonna pass the mic to you, Anna. Thank you, Dan. Um, the Barilla Prize for Regenerative Living Ecosystems is being awarded to a project that imagines how biodesign can reimagine a healthier and more sustainable food system that benefits the well-being of both people and planet. I must say it was a really difficult decision as both project finalists were well thought out, innovative, and have the potential to greatly impact our world for the future. But for the Barilla Prize for Regenerative Living Ecosystems, we've chosen the Permapack project from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. We were particularly impressed with their use of ingredients from side streams and byproducts. And we look forward to the team continuing to explore the Permapack solution, validating real world degradability and further exploring the possibilities with their molds. Congrats to the Permapack team on this regenerative solution. Thank you. Thank you. For, congratulations, Permapack. Thank you, Anna, for all of your help. Uh, we're going to now move on to the next prize. This is the Science Sandbox Prize for Public Engagement. I'm going to call John Tracy up. John, welcome. John is the Program and Media, Program and Media Officer at Science Sandbox, an initiative of the Simons Foundation. He's also been working with us for now at least three years. Uh, and it's always a pleasure to talk to you and have you on stage. It's a special pleasure to have you announce the award. So with that, go ahead, please. Well, thank you so much, Dan. And, and thank you to the Biodesign Challenge team. Another amazing year, another amazing competition. So as Dan mentioned, we've worked with uh, the Biodesign Challenge team for the last few years. Um, to create this award, uh, the Science Sandbox Public Engagement Prize, if I'm saying that right, um, to honor projects that make biotech accessible to everyone. Because we believe at Science Sandbox, and I know Dan and the team um, believe this as well, um, that science and technology must be for everyone. Yeah, everyone deserves a say in their own future, a say in our collective future. And as we've seen over the last few days, biotech is very clearly part of our present and our future. Um, and I think it's essential that we sort of dismantle the notion that science is done in silos by a certain type of person for a certain type of person. Um, science is part of culture. Uh, it's a lens through which to see the world and, and to make consequential decisions. So I really wanna thank our finalists uh, for creating truly outstanding projects. I think this year, one of the best I've seen. Um, and our winning project is a group of high school students uh, doing bona fide community-driven science engagement work that would be honestly impressive at any age or experience level. Um, and with that, uh, I'm, I'm so happy to announce the winning team is uh, the Biotech Palatero Cart uh, from the Nest Maker Space from East San Jose, California. So congrats to the team. Congratulations, team. Thank you so much, John. Every year, man, the students from San Jose, incredible. Vina, why don't you come up to the stage for the next prize? Hello. Oh, I should, I'm just going. All right, cool. You're going. Um, all right, Outstanding Instructor is up next. So I get to give this award because each year I have the absolute pleasure to meet and work alongside incredible educators around the world, whether they are a tenured instructor holding an upper level studio course or a PhD student who is running a lab. Um, our instructors, our coordinators, our tutors, and and um, all of the team leaders, they, they really step up and they take the challenge of running the biodesign challenge maybe for the first time um, at their schools and just supporting their students throughout the process. Uh, I want to read a short segment uh, from, from the winning nomination this year before I announce. Um, here we go. Ears 
ears awake, eyes open, deep breaths, and conversations. While participating in the Biodesign Challenge, we understood the kind of passion and perseverance one needs, one needs considering we had no prior experience in the field. As we look forward to the future, we know that we will be faced with new and far more demanding challenges, but we are confident with the learnings from our instructors, passion, resolve, and adaptability, we will overcome them. The winners of our outstanding instructor prize are Anusha Devan and Sneha Ravi Shankar from the Design Village in India. Congratulations. All right. Thank you, Bina. Alex, why don't you come up to the stage to announce the Community Choice Prize? All right. Um, I'm so excited. Uh, <laughs> So this is a prize that we started awarding for the first time last year. It is the BDC Community Choice Prize. Uh, many of our community, members of our community voted. We had over 7,500 votes this year. Uh, I think last year we had about 1,500, so people are definitely listening. Uh, this is the, uh, the project that you, everyone out in the community, uh, wanted to see win that you thought deserved an award. Uh, so I'm very happy to say the winner of this prize is Spoil from the Design Village. Congratulations. i uh, really looking forward to seeing where you take your project next. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Spoil. It was a great presentation, fully, totally enjoyed it. Uh, I'm gonna call Angela McQuillan up to announce the outstanding presentation. Angela is program, manage, program manager and experience designer at University City Science Center and a collaborator and friend. We've known each other for now multiple years over exhibiting, exhibiting bio design and bio art projects uh, at the Science Center. Angela, take it away. All right, thank you so much, Dan. And I'm looking forward to working with you guys again next year. Um, so first of all, I'd like to say congratulations to all the groups who participated in this challenge. I was so impressed by all of your work and it's been a real honor to be a judge in this competition. Um, so the outstanding presentation prize is awarded to the team that produces exceptional visual renderings and models and delivers an outstanding presentation at the Bio, De Bio Design Challenge Summit that communicates their project in a clear and compelling way. So the project chosen for this award reimagines the playground as a public space to create biologically diverse soil and ecosystems while acting as a convener of play for the surrounding community. Um, this project stood out to the judges as being a really unique, well-designed and well-rounded concept that's been backed up by scientific research with a clear step-by-step -step process, along with beautifully designed and illustrated video conveying this reimagined and inclusive urban space. So this year's outstanding presentation prize goes to Dirty Playground by the Design Academy of Eindhoven. Congratulations to this group and thank you for sharing your work with us. Thank you, Angela. Congratulations, Eindhoven. Wonderful project. Uh, I'm gonna call Fred Gould up to the stage now. I hope his internet's working well. Uh, we Fred is inside now, he was outside earlier. Uh, Fred is the co-director of Genetic Engineering and Society at the Genetic and Engineering and Society Center at North Carolina State University. He's gonna announce the Outstanding Field Research pr Prize. Please go ahead, Fred. Yeah, well, let me first say, I mean, it was a real pleasure for me to be involved in this, um, to see all of the unique approaches that students take. Um, this specific prize for field research uh, is given to the team that takes the initiative to go out into the field and interview experts as well as potentially affected communities in order to find and understand the real social impacts of their project. Now, there were quite a few teams who were doing those kinds of things, but this outstanding research team specifically went out in the communities, the agricultural communities, to find out what their needs were in terms of getting rid of contamination from heavy metals and um, to use a bacterial solution to this problem. They interviewed farmers and actually worked with the farmers in constructing their prototype. And it was a pleasure to see them out in the field uh, doing these things, and uh, we just hope that they will take this 
further. So this outstanding field research prize goes to Lexi Lab, uh, Universidad de los Andes. Congratulations. Congratulations team. Well done, Lexi Lab. Thank you, Fred, for coming on stage. Appreciate it. Um, I'm now gonna call Harris Wanga. Harris is Assistant Professor of Systems Biology at Columbia University. Uh, he's gonna announce the Outstanding Science Prize. Harris has the distinctive honor of being a judge since our first year. Um, and he's been with us almost every year since. Thank you, Harris, for being with us. And of course, thank you for announcing this prize. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dan. Um, it's a really great pleasure to be here and to present um, this year's Outstanding Science Prize. As, I, as Dan mentioned, I, I'm a synthetic biologist and, and microbiologist. And as a scientist myself, I'm so pleased to see all the science and technology that so many teams have brought to their project. Uh, as Dan also mentioned that I've been the judge uh, since the beginning of the biodesign uh, challenge. I've witnessed that an incredible growth and maturation of projects in terms of their scientific sophistication and how science is really used hand in hand with the design practices. So this award, uh, this prize really awarded to the team that designs and executes outside, outstanding scientific experiments and exhibits a mastery of scientific techniques. Students not only obtain an adept understanding of systems and structures in a scientific framework, but also considers the ethics and reproducibility of their work. And this year, the judges had this incredible challenging task of selecting from a really a vast array of, of teams have demonstrated excellence in these areas where they formed the hypothesis, came up with an experimental plan, carried them out carefully, and iterated to improve their approach to ultimately lead to their project goals. And this year's winner really exemplified all of these traits um, to an incredible level. So it is my pleasure to announce that the 2021 winner of the Outstanding Science Prize goes to Alto University for their project, DIPRAP. Congratulations to their team and for their amazing project. Thank you, Harris. Congratulations, Alto. Wonderful accomplishment. I'd like to call Emma Osor to the stage. Emma is the Managing Director of Black Space Urbanist Collective. Emma's been working with us for the last year, but we've known Emma now for two years. Um, and it's always just a pleasure to either bump into you in the neighborhood or, um, uh, or work with you uh, in helping develop Biodesign Challenge into its next, next iterations. Emma's gonna uh, announce the Outstanding Social Critique Prize. I hand it to you, Emma. Thanks, Dan. Um, in my work, I'm particularly interested in the ways that we can subvert and build design norms particularly with people who are marginalized by the systems in our society. And I just wanted to first say I was impressed and so honored to uh, witness so many projects who are deeply rooting and investigating the ways that our systems, whether they're plastics or racism or waste, there are so many systems that are made by our human design that can have outsized negative, con negative consequences for humans and all life forms. And so I wanna uh, present the outstanding social critique prize, which is awarded to the team that best explores and most clearly communicates a criticism of biotechnology through a social lens. The team's project addresses the pro positive and negative effects of a technology or system on users and non-users, potential societal reactions to those effects, and ways to mitigate negative ones. Um, the judges were taken aback by the way this team helped us really viscerally feel and drew us into a cautionary tale of how our approaches to control and design to solve problems can perpetuate other harmful systems. Um, we love that this team used this platform of the Biodesign Challenge presentation, leveraged ecology, technology, and their research to bring attention to the human approaches to biology um, and our, our, like how we do the work is as important as what we design. And um, so I wanna send huge congratulations to Ball State University River Defenders, who created a satirical ad campaign that imagines, use, imagines using military means to remove invasive species. Congrats, congrats, and also so much love. The judges were especially impressed with you citing your sources in the video. So good work. 
<laughs> Congratulations, Ball State. It was, uh, it was a pleasure to watch your video, both the first time and the second time during the, during the program. What, a, what an absolute bizarre pleasure to watch it. Uh, thanks, Emma, for coming on. Emma Hill, our program associate. Hi, everyone. Um, it, thank you for tuning in. First of all, it is um, time right now to move on to the runner up and overall prize winner. Um, so this year, we had 53 classrooms from 51 or 51 schools all over the world. And all of these teams did so wonderfully. And we're so proud that all of them participated. Um, but now, Drum roll, our VDC 2021 runner up this year is Spelman College Subversive Biofashion for Black Lives. Congratulations. Congratulations, team. Woo! Thank you, Emma, for, for joining me to announce them. Okay. Congratulations, Spelman. They're, they're first year. This is their first year with us. So kudos to you and the team. We're now at the moment where we announce our grand prize winner, the recipient of the glass microbe. I have it behind me. So hold on a sec. Here it is, guys. Um, I'm gonna call the winners of last year's grand prize to the stage with me. That's the zebra glass team. Uh, let, me, let me make sure I get everyone here. Uh, Masa, Viva, Emily, Matthew, Sally, thank you so much for joining. Um, thank you for an amazing project last year. Thanks for joining us again. Um, yeah, this is always an honor to, to bestow upon um, our teams. Here it is. I know it looks a little familiar this year, more than we'd like. That said, go ahead, team. Thank you, Dan, and uh, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, we want to thank all the teams that participated this year. It's been an amazing year um, for your tremendous effort in the 2021 Biodesign Challenge. Um, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And we will similarly like to acknowledge the entire BDC team for hosting this design competition. This year's projects have offered a range of unique and thought-provoking projects across the field of engineering, science, art, and design. So with that being said, we are very pleased to announce that the winner of the 2021 Biodesign Challenge is College for Creative Studies Reform. Congratulations. Hey. Yay, you guys. Two years in a row. I'm so proud of you. But finally, we're going to get this to you. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, CCS. Thank you. Fantastic Thank you. Project. And Sarah and Joe and Melanie, I know you're listening to this. I, mean, <laughs> I think we're all just speechless. We're kind of in shock here. And um, yeah, congratulations, Joe, Sarah, Melanie, amazing. Congrats. And and everybody that supported us um, here at the college. It's I'm I'm quite honestly just um just we can't believe it. So well I can't believe it. I hope Sarah and Joe um, are celebrating and jumping up and down. Joe actually is traveling to New York, I think. He might even be on the subway and watching this retrospectively. So <laughs> um yeah, thank you, everybody. Congratulations, all. And thank you for joining us again. And congratulations, two years in a row. I'm going to now call Vina, Alex, and Emma onto the stage, the virtual stage. And while they come on, um, I'm going to thank our sponsors one more time. Uh, Barilla Science Sandbox, National Endowment for the Arts, Kinko Bioworks, Ecovative, Twist Bioscience, Alginet, our, uh, our esteemed alumni, who am I missing? And of course, uh, SOS Ventures, who's, who's been with us as well. I should also thank Jeff and Mark and the team behind the scenes at Argus HD. Again, none of this would work without you and you guys have been amazing waking up 
at the crack of dawn before the crack of dawn to work with us on this. So we are deeply, deeply grateful to you for creating a, a seamless event with us. And of course, I have to one more time thank the students, the judges, the instructors. And I should also say, don't forget about the book. Um, <laughs> check out the Kickstarter, but really thank you to the students and, and the judges and the instructors. This is really about you guys. And again, another fabulous year. While I have the three of you on stage with me, I also need to thank you guys. I do it every year. It's kind of, it's kind of old hat now, but every year it's just amazing. You guys put together an amazing event. It's always seamless. The, the passion that you bring to it, uh, the commitment to the students is palpable. And I think everyone in the audience knows that uh, and feels that. So thank you team. Uh, it's, it's my honor really to, to work with you. I think we're calling the end to this event. So thank you all for joining us. Please come back again next year more projects, more ideas, more possibilities. Uh, thank you for joining us for this week. Uh, it has been an adventure. It always is. And we'll see you next time. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you. you for watching. Have a good summer. <laughs> Bye.